We are returning from executive session. Uh, I'm going to return to public session for the Monday, September 14, 2020, Central Public School Situate School Committee meeting um, at 6:10 via roll call vote. Uh, Brandon Leaning. Yes. Limblom. Yes. Long. Yes. Gates. Yes. And Hayes. Yes. Thank you. We're back in public session. Um, just want to review again in response to Governor Baker's declaration of public health emergency, a related emergency executive order dated March 12, 2020. Tenants to a public meeting shall meet remotely until further notice. Um, we are the school committee. Uh, Mr. Long, Ms. Brandolini, Ms. Limblom, myself, Superintendent Burkett are all in the Gates Middle School. Uh, Mr. Hayes is attending remotely. Um, so this is technically a remote meeting, so votes will need to be done uh, via roll call as we've done. This meeting will be recorded and posted following the meeting. Public comment will be available. The chat function will not be utilized. Uh, hopefully I can figure out how to turn it off. Again, this is a new account that just getting set up. Um, and we will be streaming this live via um, Situate Community Television Facebook Live. Um, without further ado, we will uh, continue our agenda. Um, first item uh, is acceptance of minutes for the July 27, July 27th, 2020 school committee meeting. I uh, just need a motion or any comments on those minutes. Uh, I move to approve the school committee July 27th, 2020 minutes. Second. Motion by Long, second by Hayes. Uh, Gates, yes. Limblom. Yes. Brandolini. Yes. Long. Yes. Hayes. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, okay, moving right along. Um, item number four, presentation, school reopening video. Number two, Mr. Superintendent Burkhead. Uh, thank you, Chairman Gates. Um, it's an exciting uh, week for us as we get ready for our students to arrive Wednesday for orientations and the buses are rolling on Thursday. Um, in preparation for that, I wanna thank our uh, administrators, our principals, system principals, um, our teachers, there's some guest appearances from our teachers and in, in what I'm going to discuss, uh, and also Seth Pfeiffer from the uh, Situ Community Cable Access. Um, what we've done is we've created a, another set of informational videos that we're going to be releasing out to the school community tomorrow. And uh, this time we've made them school specific so you don't have to scroll down to watch the whole video, you can kind of go to the video that uh, applies to your child's school and or um, if you are a staff member of that school. So we'll have them all available for you tomorrow. They'll also be on our website. They include things for example, drop off and pick up, um, traffic patterns for the school day, per personal protective measures that we're taking, what the inside of the school looks like as far as traffic flow, the classrooms. If you recall, we shared a, um, a similar video about a month ago, uh, what, what the classrooms would look like. This is a more detailed uh, video that will show um, uh, basically a day in a life of what a student may, or staff member may see as they enter the building. We're hoping this will be helpful in preparation and reduce some anxiety and what the schools will look like. I want to thank all our staff and, and uh, administrators for putting that together along with Seth. And um, again, we look forward to getting these out tomorrow for the public and if uh, you don't receive one or you do, you also have access to them on our website beginning tomorrow. All right. All right. I, uh, I did watch the videos today. They are out there. So uh, click away. Yeah, they are out there. They're on the website. They're on the uh, SCTV uh, YouTube page for those that access it that way. Not through the school website, but through SCTV. Um, well, they're all, uh, actually, I only watched one, but that one was very well done. Thank you to the uh, Mr. Beattie and uh, his staff there. Um, 
Athletic Department Overview, Mr. Umbriana. I have to make you a co-host. Let's see. Thank you, Chairman Gates. While you're doing that, I just want to kind of introduce um, Mr. Umbriana has been working hard with these coaching staffs and with the MIA direction. We've got some really good news that we're going to be able to start. Sports, uh, like anything, they'll look differently. Um, and we thought it was very important that uh, Athletic Director Umbriana come tonight and just kind of give a an overview to our communities. He's already had several meetings with parents, students, coaches uh, as we kick off this week. So I want to thank him for all the hard work he's done and thank you for coming tonight and, um, and presenting. So I think a lot of this new information will be helpful for everyone to see and hear. So I'll turn it over to you, uh, Athletic Director Umbriana. Thank you, Superintendent Burkhead and Chairman Gates. I'm going to try and uh, share a screen here. Let's see. All right. I think that should be good. Does everybody see that? Yep. All right. Awesome. Uh, looking forward to uh, sharing this information with you. Uh, fall 2020. I know there's a lot uh, that I'm going to throw at you guys tonight, um, but any questions, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, I will also be doing a uh, parent forum Wednesday night uh, question and answers. Um, so anybody that has questions after this, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, starting it off with just, you know, a uh, kind of a quote that I think is very fitting for last spring into this fall. Uh, I actually borrowed this from one of our boosters groups, uh, and it's a smooth sea never made a skilled sailor. And when I kind of read that and looked into it, uh, I think it's just so fitting for what we had to deal with last spring and what we're going to have to deal with this fall. But, you know, I kind of look at it as, you know, challenging, you know, experiences often you know, offer the best, you know, life lessons. And I think as we go into this fall, winter, spring season athletically, um, I think the most important thing is to remember, you know, hope and the fact that, you know, wild sports might look differently. Our kids safely are going to be able to throw on a situate uniform either the last time um, with their friends and for their coaching uh, staffs or for the first time as well. So, um, you know, I think that's got to be the message throughout uh, there's going to be a lot of modifications and regulations that I do throw at you that might be frustrating to a lot of people, but I think overall the most positive message we got to keep and the hope we got to keep is um, that our kids get to get out on the field one last, you know, one, either one last time or for the first time. <clears throat> so just to start it off, uh, fall registration, uh, tryouts do begin September 18th. Uh, just kind of have a, a list of what needs to get done um, for families to take a look at. Family ID, um, in order to step onto the field or the court the first day, all athletes must be registered. Um, I do have that link in there, and this PowerPoint is also posted on our athletic website um, for you know, uh, families to go on and register. An up-to-date physical. Physicals are good for 13 months. The MIA recently did just partner with uh, Convenient MD, uh, and there are locations in Pembroke, Weymouth, and Quincy. Uh, no, uh, you don't need an appointment for a physical. It's $20. You go in there, you fill out a little info sheet, um, say you're a situate high student athlete, and uh, it'll be $20 to do a physical walk right in. You don't need an appointment. So if you're kind of running behind the ball and you need to get a physical for uh, Friday, I would suggest going to one of those locations and getting that done. Um, baseline testing or impact concussion testing for uh, freshmen and juniors. Codes will be sent to the athlete's school email. Um, once you register, that's important because I, I've gotten a lot of emails about we have we've registered but haven't gotten uh, a code for the baseline testing. We did get approval for all testing to be done at home uh, with everything going on. So if you haven't got a code, I would suggest taking a look at uh, your son or daughter's school email because it got sent there. Uh, Three hundred dollar athletic fee uh, must be paid and the completed forms that are necessary um, when you do register as well as a COVID-19 liability form which we would have for all student athletes uh, before tryouts. Uh, fall one sports. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows it by now, but the MIA recently uh, approved a four season plan. Um, as you can see, I listed the four different seasons with that fall two being a floating season, end of February into April. Um, our fall one offerings, as you can see the ones in green there, football and cheer, I will dive into that a little bit later. Um, they are currently still in the high risk red. Uh, so. 
they will be able to practice. Uh, we will get into that a little bit later for fall one. But as far as all these other sports that are green, we did get the green light for competition uh, for this fall. A uh, little schedule breakdown of what the schedules will look like for this fall. Um, so each approved sport, uh, we'll be looking at about 11 games, 11 contests. Uh, the first game will start October 1st, except for golf, um, which will begin September 24th. So that's coming up pretty fast. Um, we will play our Fisher Division side, home and away, um, with one additional crossover game. Um, cross country will have four league meets and an all-league meet uh, that is to be determined in November. Um, we did have pass a league vote that we will have only two games a week max. Um, the start times uh, for all of that are to be determined, but um, due to the regulations, volleyball and field hockey, when varsity and JV's home, freshmen will be away. So we're just going to switch those um, due to transportation and regulations that we have inside uh, an indoor facility. Uh, cross country boys and girls, more than likely as of right now, are going to be different days. And again, that goes back to the modifications that we will get into um, the sports specific ones. So that's a little bit of a change there. Um, kind of to ease a, lo a lot of the nerves, you know, with sports starting up and with COVID, um, we did decide as ADs in the Patriot League to kind of create our own little bubble. Um, and we will only be playing schools in the Patriot League. We will be having no non-league games. It, with the exception of NDA, we did make an agreement with NDA because they were really struggling as an independent school to find games. Um, so we did make the uh, exception for them to allow for um, their sports to compete against Patriot League schools, but Patriot League schools only. And the reason why we really did that was because uh, it's just easier to track and trace if the inevitable, inevitable were to happen and someone were to test positive. It's just much easier to trace that, having it be in the league versus non-league. Uh, and the Patriot League Cup starting in November, um, this was kind of created, you know, as a cool little thing for our kids. Um, each sport will have a double elimination league tournament to determine one Patriot League champion. So that kind of gives with the tournaments and the, you know, statewide tournaments taken away, this gives, you know, our kids something to play for. Uh, just a little breakdown of what practices are going to look like. Uh, they're going to most of them will be taking place right at 3 a.m., 3 p.m., not a.m., uh, right, right after school. Um, we will thank, thankfully be able to keep all practices on the athletic complex. Uh, again, two hours max. Uh, and then this will just be kind of what we're going to look like for tryouts. Um, cross country is going to be meeting, you know, at the tennis courts and our track um, for Friday. Boys soccer, girls soccer, field hockey will all be on the different turf fields. Volleyball will be in the large gym. Uh, and golf will be heading to Widow's Walk. We will not uh, have transportation provided to the course. Um, what about football and cheer going back? Practices. Uh, so practices can't begin until October 1st. Um, that is a league uh, vote. Uh, at the moment, times and dates are to be determined, but expect very limited it, you know, conditioning only for both sports. Um, and we will reevaluate as the month of October goes on, but they're just, both sports are just so limited to what they can do right now. Uh, so it'll be mostly just conditioning. No user fee is going to be required uh, for practices. And uh, a question I've gotten that's very, uh, been very common is, can I do another fall sport and still practice for football and cheer? Um, and I, absolutely, but the rule will still be in place that, the, you know, you still have to give that loyalty to that sport that you're going to try. So if you're a football player and decide you want to try golf uh, and you do make the golf team, uh, golf takes precedence and you can't skip a golf match or a practice for a football conditioning workout. Um, if we are taking this route, I please suggest you register uh, two separate registrations on family ID just so we can cover ourselves for football and cheer as well. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, does that mean that fall one and fall two spot, uh, seasons are going to overlap? Uh, say that again. Sorry, you cut out it towards the end. When you're talking about sport loyalty, yep. what occurred to me was, well, the question that occurred to me was, does that mean fall one and fall two overlap? They do not. But because we are going to allow for practices slash workouts to take place um, for football and cheer, uh, we will allow for, you know, a football player or a cheerleader to try a different sport 
that they might not be able to play normally in the fall um, and still attend workouts. They just can't miss their fall sport that they're going to try. If they do make the team, they just can't miss a practicing game for a um, football or cheer workout. So for example, if you have a scratch golfer Mm -hmm. who makes the golf team and he's the star quarterback as well, uh, he can still play both sports. Correct. Okay. That, that's, I just wanted to clear that up in my mind. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, not a problem. Um, just a, another little quick update on our uh, complex update. Uh, all three brand new turf fields are officially open. Uh, I've been taking a lot of walks out there. It gets more and more beautiful every time I, I do walk around there. Some small minor checklist items still need to be checked off, but for the most part, everything's kind of wrapped up there. Um, the state of the art equipment nets, I, I've gotten a couple questions about that. They will be delivered and assembled on Wednesday. Um, lining of the fields, just to give you know the public kind of an idea of what uh, fields are lined. Our turf one stadium is lined for football, soccer, field hockey, boys and girls lacrosse. Um, the turf two baseball field uh, is also lined for boys lacrosse, soccer, field hockey, and our turf three um, softball field is also lined for football and girls lacrosse as well. Um, Turf maintenance sessions uh, will be scheduled to go over the care of the fields. We've already had our initial one, but I know there's gonna be a couple um, smaller sessions with coaches and stuff like that, just to kind of keep them in the loop with, you know, the turf maintenance aspect of things. And just a friendly reminder as always with any brand new large complex of this nature, um, you know, it's it's only as beautiful as we keep it. I was walking around today and I did see unfortunately lots of trash and you know, water, empty water bottles and stuff like that. So um, for all parties using it, including ourselves at the high school, just a friendly reminder, uh, please, please, please make sure to clean up uh, after you're done. Oh, hang on one sec. All right, so now we're gonna dive in quickly to some of the restrictions um, that we Peter, do. May I ask a quick question on what you've already gone over before? I'm sorry. Yeah, Mike, Mike do you mind just having him let, let him finish his presentation so we can ask questions? Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, so quickly go through the uh, restrictions that we're going to have for this fall. Locker rooms is a big one. Um, we will have limited access to locker rooms each day. Um, as of right now, it's looking like about three at a time we'll be able to enter with a mask uh, and strictly to change and then head out to practice after that. Um, our coaches do understand that, you know, if we are going three at a time, it, it will take a little bit of time to get out to practices. So, um, we will be starting practices, you know, around 3, 3.15, but um, obviously we want our kids to be safe and that's, you know, the, the restriction at this, at this time entering in and out. We will keep designated areas uh, in the school to keep bags, athletic bags throughout the duration of the day. Um, any athlete that drives to school is encouraged to keep their bag in, the, in their car. Uh, and then just a couple different items that you might want in your athletic bag, extra mask and face coverings, water bottles. We can't be sharing any water. Um, this, this fall season. So bring your own water bottles, practice gears, equipment, and hand sanitizer and disinfectant wipes. Transportation. Uh, student athletes will, will receive transportation to away games. Um, buses are limited to 26 in total, including the coach. Um, so that is going to probably more than likely impact, you know, the number of, you know, roster space that we are going to be, you know, uh, allowed to have per team. Um, Athletes in school uh, that day will be advised to wait outside for buses to arrive in the bus loop. And we are currently working on a transportation request form, uh, waiting for approval there, um, which would allow for parents and, you know, responsible adults to drive their kids to games. Uh, also, the carpooling of kids would be allowed if approval is received from all parties. Kids are not allowed to drive themselves or others um, to away events. And we really want that as a last resort but we totally understand with everything going on um, that a lot of people will probably uh, feel more comfortable just driving their own uh, kid to a game, which as long as we get that ref uh, form filled out, approved, it will be fine. Fan attendance, this is a big one. Uh, as of right now, it's been voted on and approved by the league to not allow um, fans to attend away events. And this is as we get dip into the numbers per event that we're allowed. Um, that was kind of the ultimate decision amongst ADs uh, that voted is that we, because we have such a low number of um, spectators that we are allowed at each away, each home, uh, outdoor and indoor event, 
Uh, it just made sense. Um, we are meeting, you know, with the principals to kind of discuss this in fur, uh, further, but as of right now, that's going to be the plan. This could absolutely change within a week, though. Um, indoor facilities, volleyball, um, they are allowed one spectator per athlete. Again, this might change, but as of right now, it's one spectator per um, athlete. We are going to be getting lanyards that uh, parents will have to wear. Um, we are going to give each athlete two lanyards, um, and they will – be able to give those to their parents. Um, the lanyards, in order to get in, for us to track how many people are in each facility, um, they must enter with a lanyard on, um, and they must be wearing a mask as well to enter the gym or the facility. Uh, outdoor facilities, the spectator number right now is capped off at 50 per facility. It's actually 100, but with that includes uh, everybody that's playing in the game, coaches, officials, game workers, et cetera. Um, so that leaves us at about 50 uh, for spectators. So unfortunately, it's a pretty small number. Uh, and kind of same thing, social distancing um, around the facility must be maintained, and we are going to have a sign-in sheet upon arrival as well. So a lot of different changes there, but uh, like you said, we will make it work. Sports modifications for the fall. Uh, coaches, players, officials must wear a mask during the game at all times. Um, if they are 10 feet from another player in those sports, they can pull it down, but that's going to be very, very complicated. The exception is cross country, um, where when, once they start running uh, on the course and they can maintain distance from other runners, they can pull their mask down. But at the start and the finish, they need their mask on. Um, players must use hand sanitizer before entering the field and heading back to the bench. No sharing of equipment in any sport. Uh, as on water bottles, gators will not be allowed. That was voted on and approved as a district wide policy. Um, so they will have to have masks. I'll be happy to send uh, a couple different uh, links to sports uh, specific masks uh, that help for breathing and whatnot. Um, but as you can see, there's a ton of modifications. If I were to get into every one per sport, we'd be here till 11 o'clock tonight. So um, the MIA website does have a task force link that has each sport in their specific sport modifications. Each sport, you're probably looking at about five or six pages of modifications. So any questions on those, don't hesitate to reach out, but you're, you're better off versus me just reading them all to you, uh, going on and, and checking them for yourselves. Everything COVID-19, coaches and staff, all fall coaches will be receiving a binder before tryouts um, that they will keep on them throughout the season. Each binder will have, as you can see, all those following um, pieces of information. We're doing it just so, you know, if the coaches have any questions at any time, they have a nice little resource to take a look at uh, and help out with any questions they might see throughout the year. Um, the coaches are required now to take daily attendance and keep record of each day, practice or game of their teams. That's new. Um, and that will be taking get some getting used to. Also, our coaches will be required to take the NFHS COVID-19 course. Um, as well as some additional trainings that the MIA will offer. Uh, each med kit will also have uh, extra hand sanitizer, disinfectant wipes, and temperature monitors. Uh, and a uh, protocol sheet has been created and will be handed out to every coach and athlete uh, during tryouts that just gives protocols on what if. So that hopefully will help ease some of the nerves uh, as we get into the sports season. Uh, what if someone tests positive? Um, I know the you know, nurses are gonna get into this a little bit more in depth later and they're much better to talk about this than I am. Uh, but as you can see, um, if, once you connect to this PowerPoint later on, you can take a better look at that. What if someone tests positive? The, bit, the big thing here is the, the bottom one there. The close contact within six feet for 15 minutes between opposing teams is very infrequent in many sports. Therefore, unless there really are extenuating circumstances, the opposing team and coaching staff can continue with daily activities without restriction as long as they remain symptom free. So that's a big one there. Um, that protocol sheet that will be handed out to each athlete and coach has a, a more in depth breakdown of what if someone does test positive. Uh, I did want to just give a really uh, important sailor shout out. I, I, again, I borrowed this from Superintendent Burkhead, but I wanted to give a shout out to the Situate Police Department um, who have been uh, just absolutely fantastic volunteering their time to you know run summer conditioning workouts for all of our students um, not just athletes we've had about four officers every monday and wednesday morning um, completely volunteering their time to come work out with our kids 
Uh, we've had about two, two male, two female officers each, each session. We've had about 40, 30 to 40 kids each workout. Uh, they go on Monday and Wednesday from 8 to 9.30. It's been just an awesome, um, you know, environment there. The kids are really, really liking it, and the, and the officers are doing a great job. So we're hoping to keep that partnership going, uh, both for this fall season, but also build something a little bit bigger for next summer as well. Uh, communication is key. Again, feel free, email. Uh, my uh, assistant, Michelle Patterson, is awesome. She'll be happy to answer any questions you guys might have as well. I'll obviously follow us on Twitter. That's where the quick updates come. Uh, and just to wrap it up, um, PowerPoint, and I've been starting to create a uh, frequently asked question sheet um, that will be posted on our website. Uh, just all the questions I've been gathering since March. I've, I've put them all on one document and answering all those questions. So anybody that does have questions, that might be a nice little direction uh, to get your questions answered. Again, Wednesday night, join me at 7.15. Um, we will just do a question and answer any questions you might have. I'd be, I'll be happy to answer them. And as always, I appreciate everyone's cooperation and understanding during these crazy times. All right. And that's all I have athletically. Sorry, it was a lot of information. That was great. Thanks very much, Mr. Umbriona. Good stuff. Uh, I'm going to open up the questions and comments. Mr. Hayes, I'll go to you first since you, uh, I know you have a couple. Thank you, Pete. Uh, and uh, thank you, AD Pete. <laughs> a lot of hard work there. And, and uh, it's, it's appreciated with uh, what you and all the other EDs are doing for our kids. So it's Thank you. greatly appreciated in tough times. Um, my two questions, you, you, uh, you mentioned that fields two and three are gonna be lined uh, for the various fall, fall, fall sports. And my question is, is that permanent marking or not? No, they're, they're seasonal markings. Uh, so the type of paint um, is good. It will last for that season. Um, but they will slowly start to die down to where there's no paint at all uh, after <clears throat> probably after a couple of months. So we just went with the seasonal. We had the option to make it the permanent, but uh, it just didn't make any sense. So we're just going to do seasonal and just update it each season we need it. Well, I appreciate making that decision because, in my opinion, that's certainly the correct decision. Um, Thank you. Uh, I don't think, well, I'll leave it at that. Uh, but thank you for that. And then secondly, you talked about the, uh, uh, the amount of spectators at games and limiting it to 50. And I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit because say in a assuming uh, when football starts um, uh, that the Commonwealth's requirement is still 50 for an outdoor activity. Um, I, I mean, between two football teams and coaches and staff, you're, you're, at, you're probably over 50 already. Um, so I was wondering what discussions you have had with other a ADs in, in that regard. Yeah, so I, I do know things have changed because I know it's they've bounced from 100 to 200 back down to 50 back to 100 in a matter of a month and a half two months at most so I, I know they're adamant that it's going to change again come February uh, and I'm expecting to see a completely different number come February um, but I, I know that's been one of the topics of discussion right now for volleyball um, yeah. because with 25 <clears throat> spectators or people in, involved you know most volleyball teams are showing up with you know 12 to 15 on their team plus the right. coach, plus an official. So I think there's a little bit of leeway there. Um, you know, as, as long as we know we can social distance um, those benches and stuff like that in our gyms. I think the gyms that don't have the space, we're very fortunate where we've got a ton of space in our big gym um, <clears throat> that I, I have complete confidence in us being able to successfully social distance plus getting 25 fans into our game. Uh, yeah. But I think some of the gyms that are smaller are going to have a tougher time with that. Um, so that's just kind of one of the discussions we've been having on a weekly basis. And I know it's been changing a lot, but I, I do know that um, we're in constant contact with them as far as, you know, changes in regulations. Yeah, I'm sure it's going to change daily. Yeah. 
Um, last one, um, Pete, is that um, when Stitchford High School uh, uh, hosts an event, um, who uh, who's in charge of in enforcement of those rules? And um, uh, I mean, nobody wants, uh, you know, a police state <laughs> to enforce these rules, but is this going to be a on your shoulders or where's where is it going to be yeah just gonna it's gonna be a lot on the ad's the game workers uh game administrators uh it's gonna, just gonna be a lot it's gonna have to be a helping matter especially if we got multiple games going on at once um whoever we do assign for game administration for those games are just gonna have to be very active and be you know walking around to enforce that um and as far as the on-field stuff that's going to just have to be a lot of the discussion with the coaches and the officials, um, you know, and, ma and making sure they're staying on top of that while I do the, the hard part of, you know, managing who's coming in and out of each facility. Great. All right, Pete, thank you. And, and thanks no, for, for all your hard work. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, any other questions, comments from the uh, school committee? Ms. Limblom. Mm -hmm. Hey Pete, um, Hi, you, when you mentioned the, the buses, um, in limiting, it, it, only 26 kids are allowed, allowed on each bus, and that may lead to some kids not making a team. Um, is it, have you talked with transportation about having like more buses, or is it really not feasible? Yeah, I, we've had we've started that discussion, um, but I, I think it's coming down to a point where I think a lot of schools are going to be in kind of the same boat, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as, as far as trying to reach out and outsource for different companies and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So yeah, it'll be, it's going to be difficult, but I, I guess that's why we re really kind of wanted to have that transportation request form just in case, because obviously we don't want to have to cut people if we don't need to. Um, mm -hmm. But with the, you know, regulations and stuff like that, uh, I, I do, I am a little bit nervous as far as being able to, get everybody to a different location, um, but we're gonna do our best to, to make it work. Okay. And, and that's, um, I guess that goes back to, to the importance of registering. Uh, I just wanna throw that out there too. The quicker we can register, the, the better idea our coaching staffs and myself will have on numbers and, and what we're gonna have to look into going into tryouts. And my second question has to do with the boosters, because I know at a lot of the games, they, they do a lot of sell, um, fundraising. So is that not going to be allowed this year until we know, until something changes? Yeah, as of right now, it's not going to be allowed, but we're going to, I've been in constant discussion with the boosters on, you know, how can we think outside the box, mm -hmm. um, you know, as far as fundraising is concerned. So we do, we have a couple good ideas, um, you know, but it's going to be, it'll be challenging for every, each and every one of them to really think outside the box. Uh, but as of right now, it's with the cap being 50, it's going to be very difficult. Um, I'm hoping that number come October expands and in, in, in where we can get them in to, you know, fundraise throughout the game and, and raise some money. Thank you. And great problem. presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions, Ms. Brandlini? No questions for me. Thanks, Pete. That was great information. Thank you. Mr. Long? Uh, yeah, I have two quick questions. Um, and Peter, again, thank you for all your hard work um, in putting this together tonight. Um, you mentioned in the your PowerPoint that Gators aren't allowed because of the Situate policy. But does the Patriot League have a league-wide policy on masks and what teams should be following? Is it, is it uh, so the Patriot League does not. Uh, but the M of course the MIA came out and said that Gators are allowed. Um, so that kind of put us in a, a little bit of a bind. I did talk to superintendent Burkhead a little bit of, briefly about it. Um, and, you know, I, I think we just think it's probably best to just keep it consistent throughout the district, including sports. Um, I just don't want to get into the habit of, you know, if, if Gators are allowed for sports, but not for school. And now kids are showing up to school with Gators on and, you know, so it just, I think it, keeping it consistent throughout the district, including sports, is probably our best bet and safest bet, especially now because there's so many masks coming out that are, are sports specific and performance workout masks um, that I, I, I do think uh, kids and parents will be fine wearing those. Oh, no, I agree. I just wasn't sure if the league had a, a general rule as well. Yeah. Um, and then my last question is 
are the ADs for the Patriot League or is the MIAA meeting in general just to review the season? If there is a spike, you know, God forbid that you either shut down the season to right through or, you know, when to restart and let the kids continue the, the season. Yeah, so uh, we decided actually ADs, we were meeting once a month, um, but now with everything going on, we've been meeting weekly. We'll continue to meet weekly throughout the season. Um, so there'll be that constant, you know, gathering and discussion if something like that were to happen. Um, and I do know the uh, MIA will be meet, meeting monthly with the task force as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Not a problem. All right, Pete. Thank, yeah, thanks for your um, presentation. Very helpful. I just have one question. Hopefully I don't catch you off guard at all. Um, and I'm not sure what your jurisdiction covers, but I know that we had, or you had implemented the um, unified track team. And I believe that there are some other um, club or intramural type sports at the middle school level. I'm not sure what your oversight is there or if those guidelines have been uh, discussed for those kids or if the, that's programs, those programs will look different. Yeah, so we, um, I've actually, I uh, did a little, little bit of work with uh, uh, Principal BD last year, you know, with the middle school sports. And, you know, we have started having some discussions, um, you know, about, you know, continuing to grow our middle school programs and, and offerings. Uh, and that's something that you know, I think last year with the field situation and stuff like that, it was, we were, it was a little bit difficult to really make that jump now. And then obviously with COVID, the cross country middle school league already got canceled, got shut down um, for this fall season. So uh, that's been kind of put on the back burner there. But, um, you know, I, I did actually reach out to, you know, Principal B last week and we started discussing different things, but I, I do know um, I'm hoping to continue to be involved there and continue to grow our offerings for our, our middle school kids and, and for unified as well. I would have loved to have unified basketball this fall, but obviously, with everything going on, it's uh, that's not running. So um, hopefully we can get that going for next fall. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, comments? Yeah, I had one follow up to Mike Mike's uh, question. Pete, do do our partners in the Fisher Division know that Gators are not permitted in, in situate, or how is that going to be handled? Um, so. That's kind of that was actually on the agenda for tomorrow's more uh, tomorrow Wednesday morning's meeting. Um, okay. As far as are we going to allow away teams to have Gators or not? Okay, not a problem. All right, thank you again, Mr. Umbriana. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other comments or questions, moving on the agenda, uh, Medical Advisory Committee. Thank you, Chairman Gates. Um, I want to turn this over. Our, our school nurses have been working really hard to, on this presentation, and uh, the, most of the committees here as well, so we can chime in when appropriate. But I think we're going to turn it over to um, Ms. Jones to present. Right now, Kelly. Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh. Oh, no. Can you unmute Kelly Roach? Uh, is Kelly Roach? Uh, hold on. All right. There we hey, go. everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Gates. So thank you, Chairman Gates and school committee members. Um, we'd like to update you on what we've been working on to prepare for the school year. Um, Jesse, in conjunction with DPH and their medical advisory board, has provided us with some guidelines for returning to school safely. Our medical advisory team involved in translating and implementing these documents included Superintendent Burkhead, Dr. Dutch, Dr. Stephen Lane, who's our school physician, Dr. Katie McBride from Situate Pediatrics, Bonnie Donahue in HR at SPS, Drew Shealy and Eileen Scotty from the Situate Board of Health, um, the school nurses as well as the Massachusetts Department of Public Health epidemiologists who have been great when we've reached out to them on multiple occasions in order to provide the best and most current information for our community 
and we're very thankful for their input and hard work on this. So these guidelines have been revised and updated multiple times over the summer and it wouldn't surprise us if they continue to be updated. However, we will always let staff and families know as we get any new information. The guidance that we have received has been regarding mask and PPE wearing, physical distancing, symptom checking, and guidance around what symptoms will trigger testing, as well as the handling of different scenarios that will present to us during the school year. Um, it's important to note that we'll be adhering to these guidelines and all of our interventions are based on DPH and DESE guidance. So a few things um, we'd like to talk about tonight are some documents that we have put together outlining the guidance and we're essentially just translating and implementing what DPH and DESE and the school health unit nurse liaisons have directed us to do. Each school nurse has met individually with their building staff for relaying this information as well as held some question and answer sessions. Um, this information will also be emailed to all families tomorrow. Um, we want our staff and school communities to feel safe and comfortable and we're committed to making sure that we're following these guidelines explicitly. Excuse me, sorry. <laughs> so we've developed a frequently asked questions document that was taken directly from some questions that were asked of us um, during our question and answer sessions and preparing for um, a reopening of the safe school return to school. We'll also be looking at a symptom checker that was provided by the state and a graphic based on DPH guidance regarding testing and how to handle different scenarios around positives, negatives, alternative diagnoses, as well as close contacts. The SPS nursing team were all here tonight, as well as Dr. McBride and Drew Shealy from the Situate Board of Health. And I think Dr. Lane might be here as well um, to talk about these documents. And we want our community to know that we are happy to talk individually outside of tonight's meeting to answer any individual questions you may have. I'm gonna turn this over to Barbara Yukness. Um, she's the nurse at Jenkins Elementary. She's gonna talk a little bit about COVID-19 and symptoms, which will take us into some of the things we need to do as school nurses if students or staff present with any COVID-19 symptoms. Thanks, Bob. If you could unmute Barbara Yukness, that'd be great. Thanks. Does she need to be unmuted? Yes. Who was it? Can you guys can do it? Sorry, who was it? Who was it? Barbara Eucness. Y U K N I S. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the symptoms of COVID-19, um, and people with these symptoms may have COVID-19, and they should be tested. Um, fever or chills, cough, shortness of breath, or trouble breathing, fatigue, muscle or body aches, headache, new loss of taste or smell. Next slide. Sore throat congestion of runny nose, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. And we will update this list as we learn more, but these are the symptoms so far. Next slide. Um, anyone can have mild to severe symptoms. The symptoms are very similar in children and adults. However, with any individual, they can look very different. People with COVID-19 have had a wide reported range of symptoms um, from mild to very severe and symptoms may appear two to 14 days after exposure to the virus. I'm going to turn it over to Jess now. We have a symptom checker that is available for families, students, and our staff has been provided with the same symptom checker and this is something that will go out in the email to all families in the community. So within this, you're asked to look through the symptoms. And if you say yes to any of these symptoms, your child must get a test for active COVID-19 prior to returning to school. They should stay home and you should contact your child's physician and your school nurse. The following are things that you should be contacting the physician for and staying home for. A fever of 100 degrees or higher, chills or shaking chills, a cough that's not 
due to other known causes such as a chronic cough, difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, new loss of taste or smell, a sore throat, a headache when in combination with other symptoms, muscle aches or body aches, nausea, vomiting or diarrhea, fatigue when in combination with other symptoms, nasal congestion or runny nose that's not due to other known causes such as allergies when in combination with other symptoms. If your child has had close contact, which is six feet or less for 15 minutes or more with a person who has had a cough, fever, or other symptoms of COVID-19. If your child has traveled to any states or countries identified in the Massachusetts travel restriction in the last 14 days, or if your child has been in contact with someone with a confirmed or presumed case of COVID-19. And this is what the symptom checklist looks like for family and for staff. Um, I recommend printing this out, putting it on your fridge, some, having it easily accessible so that you can review these every morning before the start of school day. Um, and again, just stay home if answering yes to any of these. I'm sure at some point we are all gonna memorize these, but for now you should have this handy to refer to daily. Next, we're gonna hear from Karen McDonald. If we can unmute Karen McDonald, please. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to start the conversation about culture of health and safety in our schools um, and using all of the mitigation strategies um, together. Um, so it's not one mitigation strategy, but a combination of these strategies. Oops. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> but a combination of all these strategies taken together that will um, reduce the risk of transmission of COVID-19. Um, so staying at home when you're sick is, we put that on the top for a reason because we don't want to try to plug through like we have in the past. We don't want to feel guilty because, you know, staying home, if you're not feeling well, it is so important that people stay home when they're sick um, to keep everybody else safe. Um, wearing a mask, hand hygiene, physical distancing, assigned seating, cohorting when possible, limit sharing of items and equipment. And then, um, so monitor, so the first one is monitoring for symptoms, um, like Jess had just talked about. The staff must monitor themselves every day for symptoms. Um, the students with assistance of their families must also be monitored for symptoms. Staff and students must stay home if feeling unwell for any reason. And um, Lauren Bennett, the nurse at Wampatuck, is going to talk about wearing masks and hand hygiene. Can you unmute Lauren Bennett, please? Okay. Thank you, Karen. Um, we require students and staff to wear masks that cover both their nose and mouth. As a reminder, gaiters are not allowed. We encourage families to pack an extra mask inside their child's backpack to wear in the event their mask gets soiled or wet while at school. However, schools will have masks available to students and staff that may require replacement during the day or if they arrive to school without one. Since it is impossible to keep students socially distanced at recess, students are required to wear masks while at recess. Next slide. It is required for students and staff to wash their hands or use hand sanitizer upon arrival to school, before eating, before putting on or taking off masks, and before dismissal. Hand washing with soap and water is the best option, but using alcohol-based hand sanitizer is also acceptable and available to students and staff. Now, Ellen will talk about physical distancing. Thank you. Can you unmute Ellen Claflin? I'm not even doing it. No. I can't find them. I think Seth is. Ellen, who is it? Ellen Claflin? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, so I'm talking about physical distancing. Okay, with the physical distance greatly reduces the risk of transmission. Physical distancing is a critical tool in preventing the spread of COVID-19. Um, so the schools have designed cohorts and using assigned seating. The students organized in groups, classrooms, and other cohorts help the mitigation transmission of the virus. Assigned seating is very is important because it effectively creates even smaller groups within the cohorts, which minimize transmission. We also will be limiting sharing. Sharing of materials will is discouraged, but when shared, they must be cleaned before use by other students. Next slide. And communications with families. Like we've said, the COVID-19 information packets will be sent home to the families. You can the student and family symptom checker, a frequently asked question document, COVID-19 quarantine and isolation guidance. Information on when to stay home as well as mask wearing and hand hygiene guidance. And if a positive case is identified, contact tracing will be conducted in conjunction with the Board of Health. The entire school committee community will be notified as of a positive case. But in keeping with HIPAA laws, the building will be identified, but not the individual student or grade. And next will be Linda Marduce from Cushing School. Hi, um, this graphic was sent out to all staff and will be sent out to families tomorrow. It's a reference tool to help guide staff and families when they encounter illness and possible symptoms of COVID-19. These guidelines are based on the revised DESE DPH protocols for responding to COVID-19 scenarios in school, on the bus, or in the community. And this guidance was dated on August 20th. So in the, first, in the first column, we will look at the positive COVID-19 scenario. So in, in that case, the person must stay home and self-isolate for at least 10 days, and at least three days have to pass without a fever, without the use of Tylenol and ibuprofen. And they must also show improvement in other symptoms. The next scenario is COVID-19 symptoms diagnosed as an alternative diagnosis. In this case, a healthcare provider has documented an alternative di diagnosis. They may return to school based on the recommendations for that alternative diagnosis. For example, if it was a case of strep throat, they would need to stay out for at least 24 hours on antibiotics. And then the other, um, item in that column is you also cannot have a fever for more than 24 hours without using fever reducing medications. The green column is COVID-19 symptoms in a negative COVID-19 test. The individual can return once symptoms have improved and no fever for more than 24 hours without the use of fever reducing meds. In the purple column, COVID-19 symptoms, but not tested for COVID-19. In this case, the person would remain home in self-isolation for 10 days from the symptom onset. You may return to school once symptoms have been gone for 24 hours without the use of fever reducing medications. The last scenario is you're a close contact to a person who tests positive for COVID-19. In that case, you must self-quarantine for 14 days after the last exposure to the positive person. Even if the close contact tests negative, the close contact must self-quarantine for the full 14 days as COVID-19 may take up to 14 days to cause illness. Next are Superintendent Bill Burkhead and Drew, Sh Drew Shealy from the Town Health Department and will discuss metrics. Thank you. Thank you, um, Linda, and thank you to our school nurses. Just wanted to give them a shout out for um, 
all their hard work and conscientious work. This is very serious information. A lot of research and hard work went into the presentation and their daily training. So I want to give you all a shout out and thank you. Uh, the next uh, few slides, uh, Mr. Shilley's uh, got a conflict. He's at his Board of Health meeting right now, so he's going to try to jump over when that's finished. Uh, but I'll, I'll take it from here. I'm going to explain uh, basically our um, our method for um, looking at data and deciding on uh, transitions from model to model and or potential school closings, closures or openings. The first document I'm showing here is the Department of uh, Massachusetts Department of, of Health Weekly uh, or Coded Health Metric. This is what the state uh, sent out in collaboration with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, as you can see from the title. Uh, and you can also see on the left side, the metric is a, a color-coded metric, uh, and it's based on 100,000 uh, population. Obviously, we have a lot less than that, so we'll have to uh, uh, use a scale um, appropriate to our population. And on the right is the DESE's expectation learning models, or these are recommendations. Um, and in the bottom, you can see on the asterisk there, it says these are measured over a 14-day rolling average and will be reported weekly uh, as part of the online DPH dashboard. Um, so just to give uh, folks an idea of where situate falls, if we were just to use this metric, and we will not be, and that's not recommended. This is uh, one metric, and I'll give examples why this is not the only metric we use. Um, so for example, in the unshaded area, uh, fewer than five cases over, and again, keep in mind this is over 14 days. So they take the number of cases uh, divided by 14 um, and then include your population. So for us to be in shaded, again, we would be similar here, would be less than uh, five cases over the 14 day average. To be in the green situate, our number would be between six and nine cases over that 14 day period. In the yellow, it would be 10 to 19. And in the red, it would be 20 plus cases over that two weeks. So if you did the math, those are what the numbers would come out to, to give you a kind of understanding of that. And currently right now, I believe we're in the green uh, situate. Um, but also just to give you an example on why we use other metrics. For example, today we're at the um, town hall doing our morning cable access um, presentation with the town administrator. And he reported there were eight cases as of last Tuesday and um, in situate. However, only two of them were currently in situate. The other six were um, people, whether it's college students or others who traveled who have not been in situate. Their home addresses are in situate. They caught the uh, virus when they were outside of situate and they're quarantining outside of situate. So there's a good example of how the numbers may uh, be tricky for you. So in actuality, when the number is eight, we only really have two here. So we have to be practical when we look at that. So here's just the template we use as a guide and it's a good starting place. Can we go to the next slide, please? This also came as an attachment with that original document from DESE, and it kind of calls for uh, looking at other measures, and I'll kind of just kind of highlight it here. Uh, it talks about the um, 100,000 uh, population as a metric, but also says schools should also monitor whether cases are increasing or decreasing in your town uh, versus the, the prior period. So are we on an upward or downward trajectory over time? So we will be doing that. Monitoring positive testing, uh, percent positive, this is also called. Um, it's as an important metric, um, which we'll also be looking at in our model. And then also communication and consultation with your Board of Health. They're part of our uh, um, weekly uh, advisory committee, so we've got that built in. And I'll share that in the next few slides. And also talks about the district, uh, considering underlying data that may indicate other concern trends. For us, that would be looking at geographical um, areas. Those towns that um, are adjacent to or around situate uh, that get our number up too close to 100,000 when looking at all the uh, towns neighboring us. That's something also we'll be looking at. Um, then this one talks about multiple weeks of data. We should look at multiple reports, not just one week. It's as a snapshot of time. All that's important when making big decisions on transitioning in, from one model to another or opening or closing schools. Um, it's advised 
for obvious reasons, you look at multiple weeks of data, unless there's a real extreme situation where you have to use obviously common sense in the data time. Next slide, please. So here's, you know, the question has come up for a long time and our advisory has met over several weeks and worked with, um, you know, DESE guidelines and Department of uh, Public Health on these um, ideas. And you just saw some from some of the recommendations that we're taking from. And so these are some of the considerations that we'll be doing. So we're, we're um, the first one is the DPH metric that we just went over and, and looked at the color coded metric is obviously a good starting place, kind of see where our numbers fall from week to week uh, as situate and trends over time. The next one is the positivity rate, which means the percent of all coronavirus tests performed in situate that are actually positive. The state recommendation for benchmark is 5%. Once you hit 5% in your town, that it, they talk about possible shutdowns or closures. Um, you know, it's been brought up at school committee meetings before by our members and our community that we want to be a little bit more conservative to that. So we've put a number at 3% as one of our guiding uh, measures. So we want people to understand the community that we're going to keep that on the low end when we take this all into consideration. So you're looking at the metric. You're also looking at percent positive rate. The next one is an obvious one is individual school cases. So in the example I gave of the eight people that had it in situate over the last period, two only living in situate uh, and quarantining here. Well, are those two are those two people students or staff in our buildings? So I think that's another important metric we have to look at. If they're not and they're uh, family members living in a, a, a home in situate that have no connection to anybody in situate, public schools, there's a good case for keeping things open. So I think when we start using all these metrics together, it gives you a collective case for making a common sense decision. Um, so obviously the opposite could be true as well. We could be in the green and have eight cases at one school. Now there's a need for concern. So then we would have to um, make a decision based on those cases and what's happening in our schools. So that's an important data point. The last one is, um, again, something I alluded to, the geographical data surrounding towns. Um, it allows the um, medical advisory committee to look at the population number closest to 100,000 we can get with all our neighboring towns added up um, to align with the metric. It also allows the uh, MAC to understand the potential spread of the virus. You know, for example, if we're in the green and Cohasset, Marshfield, Duxbury, everyone around us is in the red, um, there's, some, there's some red flags, pardon the pun, but uh, we have to look at, at that information as well, as also as, you know, the public, um, the public mood. You know, if, if there's, a, there's high incidence all around us and we're, we're not yet in that situation, how do we best prepare for it? So I think that's important. So, and number three allows the uh, MAC the ability to assess public perspective. That's kind of what I just summarized there. What's the mood of the community, how things are going, what's happening around us. So those are four data points we'll be working on, uh, excuse me, looking at in our weekly meetings. And keep in mind our meetings can happen uh, in a split second. We'll be looking at the data daily. So I don't want people to think just because we're meeting weekly doesn't mean we're not looking at this every single day. Uh, it's on my favorites. Obviously I look at it every morning. So. Uh, as, as, so as, so does our, our nurse leader and her team, and as well as the, the, the board of health director. So we're all kind of looking at this every day. And uh, next slide, please. I believe this is the last slide. Um, so this is more of the operational, how it all works, taking that information into consideration. Um, so we've already kind of went over the who's on the um, advisory committee and we'll meet weekly and we time this up on purpose because the data comes out every Wednesday afternoon. So we'll meet Thursday morning. We have a running meeting every Thursday morning. The first thing we'll do is to, you know, kind of talk about the data, look at those four uh, points that we talked about, the geography, the positivity, the trends over time, the color and the metric surrounding towns. And um, that's, and so we've been already doing that as practice. Uh, to, to make sure that we're starting school in a good spot. And we do, do believe we are. So we met, um, we met last Thursday, we'll meet again this Thursday. And then uh, Department of Element, the next one is DESI and DPH. Um, these are who we keep in communication with. Uh, if we're to close a school or multiple schools, um, it's my responsibility to be in touch with our school committee members, obviously, and the Department of Elementary and Secondary 
elementary education need to be notified, but we'll also be in contact with the Department of Public Health. So for example, if we come out and read the numbers and we're getting concerned, a couple of our metrics are percent positive is over 3%. We're climbing up into the yellow, uh, surrounding towns are in the red. And so three or four of our metrics are kind of getting up there. So that's a conversation with the, the Department of Health and, and, and you know, get some guidance there and what we're at and talk specifics. Um, by meeting with the Board of Health also on the town nurse, we've got specific cases on, you know, our numbers is X, Y, or Z. Are those cases um, students in the buildings or are they town members and how many are out of the, out of the town that aren't impacting us? So that, that's the next one, situated with Board of Health, having them on, on the committee and in regular communication has been fabulous. Um, and we have a great working relationship, so that's important. And the last one is transparency and communication. That's kind of been our goal from the start. Um, every Thursday, you can expect a uh, correspondence from the, the medical committee in layman's terms on these data metrics and what they mean and where we're at and what we're planning to do each week. So we may, you know, we may say there's eight cases this week, only two are in situ, kind of like I explained. We're in good shape, we're in the uh, green. The surrounding towns are in good shape, they're in the green. And we will explain to our community and send it out in our Thursday thoughts also had that in the prime spot on the uh, homepage of our website. So people can just go there if they don't get the Thursday thoughts. So we'll have a couple of mechanisms to get that information out, but you can count on um, as early as this Thursday, getting your first um, communication on that so that people will be in the know. And if we were to have a situation where we'd have to meet uh, for, like I said, things bubbling up, we won't wait till that Thursday we'll meet as needed and get the correspondence out to the community as soon as possible. I think that's the last slide. Um, it, Mr. Shealy, do you have anything to add? No, I got on the very, very end of the presentation. I thought it looked great though, no. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be proud of me. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, the entire team, medical advisory. Was it medical advisory? The Mac. Thank you to all that uh, put together that presentation. I think, I, I think that uh, this is really the you know crux of what we're we're up against. Um, and there's a lot of good information here, and uh, I think that the planning steps have been done. Um, now we just kind of need to see how everything um, plays out in the in the coming weeks and months. Um, with that being said, I want to uh, open up to the school committee to see if there are any comments or questions. I'm going to start. He, I'm going to start with Mr. Hayes. I know he has some. You tell, we can't hear you. Telepathically. Uh, sorry. Anyway, uh, and I want to thank the, the advisory committee. I think this is certainly um, our committee um, wall defense for our staff and our students. And I can't thank you enough for the hard work and the diligence and the expertise that you're providing for, for Situate. It is, uh, uh, it is indispensable. And uh, I, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I do have a few questions. Um, one is, I know uh, I believe a lot of some of the charts and, and all that were, were, were DESE charts and all that. Uh, but two comments on uh, is that um, it required it, it says that mass are required to cover the nose and the mouth. Situate public schools requires mass that cover the nose, mouth, and chin. Um, so, I mean, I wanna make sure um, that that is not lost in, in, in the document or lost in, in, any, in any discussions. Um, my second comment, I don't know, it's probably not possible or advisable to go back you know, if we were all in the same room, we could, but if we could go back to uh, that metric chart number one, uh, and believe me, I, I greatly appreciate how that uh, you are recommending and we are following 
a multi-metric system to to keep our kids and staff healthy. Um, but in, in uh, I know that Jesse had in the green would be uh, I believe it's the kid. Mike, we lost you. What went into that part of Desi's recommendation and knowing that this is a recommendation only, um, if, if you all concur in that recommendation. Mike, Mike, you went a little, we uh, lost your, uh, audio for a couple of seconds there. Okay, you have a it just real quick, I, um, the DESI recommendation on the first metric chart uh, in the green area um, that talks about people who have tested uh, negative, um, that they can return to school if their symptoms improved, which as I understand it, it is a change in DESI uh, requirements uh, uh, and I was wondering if, if anybody can t talk about what went into that yes that that chat it's the blue test uh, no excuse me the green the green uh, column I my understanding was that had been changed um, and am I right in that? And, and do we know why that was changed? I'm not sure that I know that that, that changed. Um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's changed either. Okay, I thought, it, Bill. I thought in that backup, it, it said that that had changed. But I can I can double, I can double check that. Kelly, are you aware of that changing? Could we unmute Kelly, please? Hi, sorry, I was trying to raise my hand. So um, with regard, Mr. Hayes, to the um, COVID-19 symptoms and the negative COVID-19 test, yes. we had to re word that actually um, Desi's document had a discrepancy in its own documentation um, that when we were going through the documents, um, the Citro Public School Nurses, we actually asked Dr. Uh, asked Mr. Burkhead to ask Commissioner Riley to clarify that because the documents contradicted themselves in their own document. So we asked them to clarify and they did say that that was um, a, a typo in the document and they changed it from when symptoms have resolved to when symptoms have improved and the symptoms have improved is the correct wording. Okay. And that's why that change was made. Okay, and you think that, and is it everyone's uh, opinion that that's sufficient? Not, their, not Desi's explanation, um, but that, I mean, there are false negatives out there, certainly, um, mm -hmm. hopefully fewer and fewer each day, but, um, um, And again, it, it's it's one metric that we're using out of multiple, which is I think is all a big comfort level. Um, so um, our medical advisory committee is is on board with that. Yeah, that I mean, I can I can pass this question over if Dr. McBride or Dr. Lane uh, want to jump in here, but. Sure. Um, I think, yeah, it's just, it's important to, to add the and piece of that, which is yeah. that, you know, no fever from, um, you know, for 24 hours without use of Tylenol or Advil. Good um, point. Yep. Good point, Kelly. All right. Thank you. Thank I you. Mean, I, th I think you have to have that because we don't have testing for everything, right? Sure. So even though we're walking into 
continuing COVID and then flu, but we also have other viruses going on. And, and that part of that slide is talking to the other viruses, right? So I just say that you have a cold but you don't have COVID because your COVID testing is negative. It'd be really nice if we had rapid viral testing for all the viruses, but we don't. Yeah. Um, so that that is what that green is, is giving the leeway of saying, we've tested you for COVID, it's probably some other viral thing. And so we treat it as some other viral thing, which prior to this is if your symptoms were getting better and you didn't have a fever, you can go back to school. So Agreed. that's where that goes. That's a good point as well. And, and um, again, um, I'm using you guys as my as my <laughs> guy. There's no certainly, and I think the entire town is and and is uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know grateful beyond words in 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 the work that you're doing in the service you're performing. Um, I had one other question, and it's about the um, the rate of positive testing. Um, we've discussed this at school committee meetings, and, and I, uh, with a lot of discussion on a more conservative, certainly than the five percent. Um, one of the discussions we had, and, and one of the things that I've heard from. Um, some parents and some teachers is that uh, given the fact that Massachusetts is, uh, I think, at what, 8.8% um, that even using three might not be conservative enough. And, and, and the number 2.5% was discussed at school committee. Um, so I was just wanted to get some comment uh, from you guys on, on that 3%. Yeah, so I'll start, Mr. Hayes. I think, um, you know, we, I guess if 2.5% two, two and, and is in line with us moving in the red, in the metric, and uh, the percent positive, I mean, excuse me, the cases in our school or impacting our school are um, even in the single digits. I think those are all concerns, certainly. I think it's one measure. So I think we put 3% as a very conservative guide, but certainly it could be 2.5 in line with other things on that list, geog geographical areas too. So I, I think we're not stuck on 3%. We're just making sure that we're using a conservative number. Again, it's my concern. I appreciate that and, and agree. I guess my concern is, is that we're at such a low number right now, heading into the flu season as well, um, that that is conservative as as, as possible, in my opinion, so it's the best way to go. But again, uh, I want to rely on you guys, and um, you know, I have full faith in, in, in what you've done and what you're doing, so, and what you're going to do, so. Uh, but I just bring that up, I mean, uh, Going from 0.8 to 0.25 uh, is a would be a big jump, um, and presumably would see that jump coming and and have plen and have warning on that jump. But it is a uh, you know that half a point could 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 mean a lot. But uh, but I appreciate it and, and, and again, it, it's only one of the metrics that we're also using. I agree. And I, I, I was speaking with the town administrator this morning, and we had from last Tuesday morning when he did his weekly report till this morning, we had eight new cases um, identified within the town. Six of those cases are out of state where we're assuming it's college kids that have gone back to school, they've tested positive at college, now they are quarantining at college, but because they're situate residents, that number is going to reflect in our color metric when the numbers come out on Wednesday. So it is, it's just one of the metrics, and that's why we've included, you know, Hull, Cohasset, Marshfield. We'd love to try to get 100,000 people in small towns around us to get to that 100,000 
number that they use on all of their color coded metrics. So if we use the school systems within our little area, that's just another way that we can look at our geographical area and say, how is coronavirus acting in our community now? Is it spreading within Situate? Is it spreading within Situate, Cohasset, and Marshfield? These are all things that we're going to be looking at when decisions are going to be made. And we'll be looking at these, these items Thursday morning. State numbers come out Wednesday night around 6 o'clock. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, you know, we, we've talked about uh, tonight and before is the value of multiple metrics. But um, I mean, if you take a look at what happened in Dedham, what did Needham do, you know? Uh, you know, and uh, th those are the big, one of the big concerns I have, so. But again, um, that's all the questions I have. I just want to reiterate all of, all of, to all of you uh, on the committee, uh, advisory committee that you are doing work that, uh, I mean, we can't do anything without your advice. You know, we can't reasonably do anything without your advice uh, and guidance. And it's, I appreciate it again from the bottom of my heart. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, anyone here have any questions? Ms. Lindblom. Hi, uh, yeah, I wanna echo what Mike says, just thank you so much for all the hard work that goes, that went into this presentation and all the work that you're doing behind the scenes. Um, but I also have a question on that chart that Mike asked, the first column, um, the positive COVID-19 test, it says you must stay home and self-isolate for at least 10 days. Um, is that, um, that 10 days is, yeah, you're counting the, uh, from the date of, that they get the test result back, or I know a lot of people will probably do the rapid test, but will it be from when the, it's like that swab is collected? Because some, because you could collect a swab, you could ha go in for a test, and if it doesn't come back for a couple of days, are you are you going to count back like day one is when the swab was done? So it's my understanding that it is. Um, if you're asymptomatic, it's 10 days from that positive test. And if you're symptomatic, it's 10 days from when the symptoms began. Um, if you want, Dr. McBride or Dr. Laney, if you want to hop in on here and correct me if I'm wrong. 10 days from the day she, the test was taken. So if the test was taken on a Tuesday and they got the results on Friday, it's not 10 days from Friday, it's 10 days from Tuesday. Tuesday. Right, okay. That's what I thought. Um, and I have a, I have a question for, for Drew, um, just out of curiosity, those, so we get re, um, those eight, I'm sorry, six positive cases now. Are those cases counted in the towns that those uh, nope. people are? They're not. Nope. So I'm assuming that <laughs> with all of the college kids going back to school, I would assume that Boston's numbers are probably a little bit greater than what they're actually showing because of the college there. That is bizarre. <laughs> it, but it's how the system's set up, you know? Oh, okay. Thanks. <laughs> it is um, bizarre. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. If you can leave that chart up. Sorry, Nicole. I'm going to jump in just yeah. so I don't forget. All right. Yeah. Um, I just have a question. I guess, you know, there's going to be all different kinds of, <clears throat> well, theoretically, could be all different variables in terms of situations we're faced with. But one that I have is, um, if there is a family member or a sibling uh, of a COVID positive, under what chart does, it, does that fall under here? Under what category? Is it a close contact? Um, and with that being said, the self-quarantine, um, is that separate? Is that even more harsh than a stay-at-home quarantine? Just want to make sure that we have some so folks are aware if there is a sibling who tests positive and how that would work. I'm not sure who could best answer that. Yeah, so if there is a, a positive case in a home and there is a sibling or a parent that has been defined as a close contact, which, you know, if we live with someone, we're going to be a close contact, then that close contact should be tested. And regardless of their test, they still have to quarantine for 14 days after the last exposure to that person. So if, you know, I have two kids and one of my kids tests 
negative, but my other kid tests positive, that child that tested negative still has to quarantine for the full 14 days. Okay. Does that make sense? You know, it does. No, it's, uh, no, it makes a lot of sense. I just wanted to be, um, be sure that we had that potential. Uh, Kelly also has to quarantine for 14 days. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kelly, your kids can't get this, okay? Yes, yes. Yeah. My kids are grown. They're good. They're good. in their own place. <laughs> but is, is, there, is there a difference between um, self-isolation uh, and self-quarantine? So isolation is what you do when you're ill. So if you have, it's considered isolation if you're isolating when you're ill. And quarantining is if you have no symptoms and you're staying okay. away from other people. Okay, thank you. So quarantine is if you're possibly sick. Isolation is when you are sick. Okay, thank you. Um, that's all that I had, Nicole. So Kelly, if, if a student has positive in a class, at what point does the whole, how do we, when does it end sort of? So it would be. <laughs> <laughs> So give us the scenario. That's a million dollar question, positive. Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> so if a student tested positive in a class, what we first would do was contact um, either we would find out first or Drew would find out first, depending on who gets the, re the information first. So we would work closely with the Board of Health to um, contact Trace. And so then what we would need to do is to uh, identify who was a close contact in a school setting with that student. So I'm so thankful that Sitch was doing six feet of social distancing because a close contact is defined as being within six feet for 15 minutes or more. So ideally, if we're all doing what we should be doing and doing our physical distancing, ideally, there should be no close contacts identified in that classroom, right? So um, that's what we would do. We would talk to the teacher, we would talk to um, the family, find out who those close contacts were in conjunction with the Board of Health, and we would go from there. Okay. Thanks. I think it's, a, a, again, like everybody said, thanks everyone for all the hard work. I think this is such a good holistic approach and the more information we have, the better decision making we can have. So um, I think it's great with all the updates and frequent meetings and everything. I know it's a lot of work, but um, hopefully for the best outcomes and everything. So thank you all very much. Any other questions or comments, school committee? Pete, I had one question for our superintendent. Go for it. So, um, again, I just just out of curiosity, I wanted to know: Does every town have a, a medical advisory committee like we do, or are we ahead of the curve in that regard? If you know, I don't know about all, Mr. Hayes. I know uh, many do. They have some variation of this. Uh huh. Some might just be the superintendent and the uh, board of health director and their nurse leader. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm part of the fact that ours is pretty inclusive and comprehensive. Great. Yeah. And, I, uh, I, I will add that I was on a conference call on Friday with the 361 boards of health throughout the Commonwealth and DPH and DESE um, representatives, and they were encouraging boards of health to work very, very closely with their school departments to make sure that we do have a cohesive unit that's working together and communicating together on a regular basis. So we've been doing this now for about three or four weeks. I felt so good hearing that, knowing that we're that much further ahead of the curve. So I was happy to hear that. And I, thank you, Mr. Shealy. And I just want to follow up that we've got, you know, some volunteers on there, including, you know, Dr. McBride and you know, Dr. Lane, the extra hours just in, I know Dr. McBride's here tonight, just having them, those medical experts, um, you know, volunteering their time and being local, having that local connection where they're obviously passionate about the safety of our town and our kids. So um, we're really blessed, I think, and we've, uh, everyone's just kind of chipping in and I think strong communication and, and having the right communication. I, I'm learning a ton as we go as well, but, you know, I'm certainly not a doctor, but having these bright people around us and being knowledgeable and having a plan, I think is gonna help us as we move forward. Sure, go ahead, Ms. Brandolini. Um, so if we, if the, through the team's contact tracing methods, if it's 
if you determine, say, somebody in a, a classmate, uh, you think it's wise that they go get a test or um, quarantine or something. So how will, who's going to notify the, that specific family? And I know we, it was mentioned in one of the slides about, um, you know, uh, that you wouldn't mention the child's name or anything, no identifying information. Will it be the nurses that will have that task of uh, calling families or principals? We'll work in conjunction with the Board of Health. Um, the Board of Health usually does the contact tracing, but will assist with seating charts, which is why those seating charts and the cohorting is so important. Um, and we'll work together hand in hand with that. So, and I'll just add a little to that. What we will, we'll work hand in hand closely with Kelly. Eileen Scotty, our public health nurse for the town of Situate, would get the information that we have a positive case. She would take that, contact that family. If it's a child, talk to the mother of the child or the father of the child. That's where we would determine who is a close contact and that we would contact that close contact. So let's say that the mother says, well, you know, I have a, another son here. Well, you know what? That son should also be tested, quarantined, isolated, however it works out with the test comes in. And then she says, oh, and I did a play date with my next door neighbor's friend. Too. Well, that's not going to be another close contact. Mm -hmm. They were in. So that's how it would come. And then we would also get in touch with Kelly and find out who the teachers. So does Johnny leave his mask up all the time or does Johnny pull it down a lot? Are there other extenuating circumstances that we need to look at? So it would be a whole case history that we'd work on. And I'd just like to add to that. It just kind of goes back to the importance of the mitigation strategies we're using. In the, in the cooperation we need from the parents and the community members and our students to practice these uh, measures when you're outside of school as well, uh, because bringing it into school isn't going to help anybody. So I think it's really important because the way the guidelines are set up, um, even if you're a student that con contracts the coronavirus and you're in a class, but you haven't been within six feet of anyone else, you've had your mask on, you followed the procedures and guidelines, you know, under those circumstances, you're not spreading the virus necessarily, and you're not a considered a close contact. So I think the more we can emphasize that culture of safety within our schools uh, and outside in our community, I think the better off everybody will be. And excuse me, Pete, but I lost connection for a minute, but I'm back. With, uh, so I did want to ask Bill one more question. Lost again. We can't hear you, Mike. We can't hear you. And you froze. Nope. Mike, try again. We can't hear you, Mr. Hayes. It says I'm not muted. No. Nope. Try again. How about now? You? That's good. You can hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, Bill, I just, I just wanted to just uh, reinforce um, that going forward, as we meet all the challenges, and hopefully they're few and far between, but as we meet the challenges going forward, that uh, all decisions regarding these matters um, will be made by the school committee upon your recommendation, correct? That's correct, Mr. Hayes. Okay. Is that all, Mr. Hayes? That's it. All right. All right. Uh, I just want to echo what everyone else said. Thank you for everyone, uh, everyone that's part of the uh, MAC team. I just want to say that it's it's great. It's great to have involvement from across the town. Um, I know Drew. We haven't officially met, but I'm. I'm Though I'm not glad for the reasons that you're involved, I'm glad that we have the support of the town um, in this particular situation. I think that uh, it's a great step to um, to show our inclusive inclusiveness here, and hopefully, can carry over to other matters as well. But I appreciate your and your entire team and our entire um, medical advisory team. So thank you again. I don't think you'd ever. I don't think any of you folks thought you'd be the forefront of, of going back to school. So um, take a bow and thank you and, and good luck to you.
Um, with that being said, uh, we moving on the agenda. This is the first uh, period for public comment. Um, as usual, please use the reaction emoticon emoji uh, to raise your hand, and I will um, acknowledge you and ask you to unmute, and we'll go from there. Yep. I just saw Alexa Houghton. Hi, thanks so much. Um, I just have two comments for consideration. Um, my first is that it's my understanding that it's been decided that all remote students are going to be grouped in multi-grade level groupings. Um, because of this, it seems that the class sizes for those groups are really large. Um, for example, my son is in the grades 2-3 uh, group, um, which would be upwards of 40 plus students in it for one teacher. And it seems that those numbers are rather unmanageable for teachers and unfair to the students. Um, and it seems that those numbers would then also continue to go up when students get sick and then need to quarantine and then would get added to those classes. So I just think that that is a plan that these class sizes need to be re-examined. So that's my first comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, my second comment is that it's come to my attention that uh, the school will no longer be deep cleaned on Wednesdays as was previously discussed um, because there's going to be staff in the building. Um, I'm obviously not advocating that the cleanings be done while the staff are there. But I'm uh, incredibly concerned that those do cleanings will not be done at all, especially in the middle and the high school levels, uh, where there's only going to be um, school-wide cleanings once a week because they won't be having the ones that, um, the midday cleanings that the, between cohorts like the elementary schools will. So I'm strongly encouraging that the schools rethink this. Um, I'm certain that there are gonna be a lot of other families who are gonna feel the same way I do about not having those Wednesday deep cleanings. Those are my two comments. Great, thank you very much. I oh, sorry, I need, I, sorry, I meant to, uh, I need you to state your name and either your address or where your kids go to school. Absolutely, I apologize. My name is Alexa Houghton. My daughter is in the high school and my son is at Hatherley. Thank you very much. Hmm? Uh, Mr. Berger, can you comment on the cleaning on Wednesdays? Yes, I, I think there's been some confusion on what deep cleaning means. I, don't, I think if you have 10 different people, what it means, they'll have 10 different definitions. So I'll just clarify that. To us, a deep cleaning is an extremely thorough and uh, in-depth cleaning of a building. Obviously, it can be done better when there's less occupants including children um so i don't think it's uh, you know i think there's been a fear out there that they we're using special chemicals that are harmful to people that's just simply not true i think that the the deep cleaning in our sense without children in the building on wednesday and that was the initial concept which would allow the custodians more access to the classrooms and more time to be in the classrooms cleaning thoroughly under the desk the desks you know all those places that will be done you know at night too but you just can't get to that all during the school day with kids there. And so I think it still can be done with staff there, certainly. Um, and that'll, so I, I think that that's a misconception that there won't be any deep cleaning that will continue. Um, and Wednesday just makes it a lot easier to do with, uh, without any um, you know, large number of students in the building. We'll be able to get to more um, classrooms and then more depth cleaning. Great, thank you. Um, next up is a was it B. Euknis? I'm not sure. B. B. Euknis? I asked her to unmute. I'm really sorry. That was error. An error. Okay. So you do not have a question or a comment? No, okay. sorry. All right. Uh, well, uh, seeing. Oh, we just got another one pop up. Uh, Melena Davidova. Hi. Uh, this is Milena Davidova. 
Um, I'm at 142 Country Way and I have a seventh and ninth grader. Um, my question was about um, the level of trust you're instilling in or hoping for uh, from families and their behavior outside of school um, to emulate the recommendations that the school district is trying to uh, encourage at the school level. And um, I was wondering if it would be, as a comment, um, would it be possible to include some sort of a letter to each family where they have a commitment and so they outline the rules that are being done at the school level and to encourage that behavior outside of school in, in light of um, social gatherings coming up like Thanksgiving and Christmas and all that. So that's my comment, thank you. Thank you. I, that is, I mean, the expectations of families are that they will uh, abide by proper social distancing guidelines. I know that it's not possible in all situations to equal those that we're adhering to here in the district. Um, don't know what jurisdiction we have outside of school. Uh, we just ask that all families abide by the rules that, uh, that are most appropriate. Um, Katie McBride. Yeah, hi, I would just uh, add that what I'm telling families right now is we're walking into um, allergy season too, right? So if you look at all the symptoms, um, some of these symptoms for COVID are very vague and can um, be seen in a lot of things, right? You have allergies, you have a cough and you have a runny nose. And so what I've been recommending and what a lot of my colleagues are recommending is that if your kid has allergies, be on top of giving them their allergy medicine. Don't wait until they're full-blown symptoms and now you're confused. Same thing is if you have a kid who has asthma and has known triggers around viral season or around seasonal changes, is that you just want to be on top of these things. Um, of course, life gets in the way and as a parent, it's hard to be on this. But I think this year with uh, the fact that we don't have really great testing and fast testing right now, although hopefully we'll get some soon. It's just really important to be on top of the things that you know trigger your kids for some of these symptoms. Great, thank you. Would you mind stating your name and your address and or where your children go to, if you have any children in this district? <laughs> no, just, no, just, I, on public, just on pub, for public record, that's all. Yeah, it's Katie McBride. Um, they, and I work at Situ Pediatrics, but my kids go to Hingham. Perfect. And your address? Uh, 157 Central Street. Great. Thank you. It's just for the public. Right? We appreciate it. Sure, no problem. And I think I'm the one falling under the uh, allergy issue here. <laughs> yes. So thank you for that uh, vote of confidence. <laughs> um, there are no other hands raised uh, at this point in our meeting. So we will move forward with old business. Uh, Non-union personnel agreement amendment, uh, Superintendent Burkhead. Yes, thank you, Chairman Gates. Um, I'd like the school committee to consider amending uh, non-union personnel, our Medco director uh, agreement to additional work days and corresponding salary increase to align with the increased demands of the job responsibilities. I'll move as presented. <laughs> Any uh, further discussion? All right, motion by Mr. Hayes, do I have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Livlom. Uh, roll call vote. Brandolini? Yes. Gage? Yes. yes. Long? Yes. Livlom? Yes. Hayes? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. And moving on to 2020-2021 school calendar. If you recall, about a month ago, we voted on the, um, the school calendar itself, um, if you will, the front part of the school calendar with the actual dates, the vacations, and start date, end date, all that kind of stuff. That's been approved. What we're, we waited on was the back of the calendar, which includes uh, school start times and um, more specific times like that. And um, at the time we went over the calendar, we still didn't know if we were going to adjust those times. So we, we, put, we hit the pause button on that. So this is simply voting on that second page. Um, 
which includes telephone numbers, start of school day and times, as well as district early release and half days if we uh, return to in-person learning. And just to get folks out there um, in the community on the calendars on those half days or those um, in-service days, if you will, those are going to be remain on the calendar, but uh, they're there in case we go back to full learning. Otherwise, we'll currently follow the hybrid model where every Wednesday will be a remote day. Any comments or questions on school calendar or updates? Mr. Fralini. Um, yes, so not particularly related to the back side of the calendar, but as a separate piece of calendar related business, um, I would like to just bring up, if we could bring um, the topic of Columbus Day versus Indigenous Peoples Day to our diversity, equity, and inclusion subcommittee to further uh, dig into that and see what recommendations could be made for our district. Um, it's something that has come up recently and um, through our Mass Association of School Committee um, email list serve as well. So it's something that's happening in other towns and I think it's appropriate and timely that we discuss further and I wanted to see what the committee's sense of uh, desire was to do that. Any discussion or comments? No, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> Mr. Hayes? I have no questions or comments, no. <laughs> um, no, I, th I think it's a reasonable expectation. Um, I think I have a couple comments. One is I'd like to, not for overkill, but I think we need to review all of the um, I guess recognized days, holidays. I'm not sure if there's other days out there uh, rather other than just Columbus Day. I'm not an expert on it. I haven't looked at the calendar specifically, but uh, if, we're gonna, if we're gonna look at it from that lens, we might as well look at all of the holidays so we can review them all at once. Um, perhaps this is the only one, I don't really know. Um, I also think we need to, to some degree, coordinate with the town. This is, you know, set a precedent with the with the Board of Health. We're working collectively with them on our, our return to school medical plan. I think that it would be consi for consistency. It would be nice to work with the town to see if if, if they would be considering the same change. Um, I think we want to have uh, once it should be similar across. Mm -hmm. um, so with that being said, I, I'm I'm very open to it. I think that it would be the right place now that we have our own diverse equity inclusion team, uh, sorry, subcommittee, and the town has their own, and I'm not recalling the name of it. It's just mm -hmm. called something differently than ours. I would just be aware of the timing of it. I think that we vote our school calendar. So we would need to theoretically best case vote this. If we had a recommendation for a name change, it would need to be in time for our school calendar potentially. I don't know when we'll generally vote that. I know it's usually like March, I think. Uh, I, I don't know how, long, how much of a discussion it will take to do this, but I would just recommend the subcommittee come back to us and perhaps Mr. Hayes, I think you're the liaison with the uh, town. Yeah. Uh, so coordinate to make sure that, I did reach out to them briefly. Um, you know, I think timing was of, a, was of concern as they're still setting up their committee. I think we have six months to do this. I think that's plenty of time, I think, to coordinate the town and the, and the school district. Yeah, the so town is still cool. certainly setting those up, Pete. And, uh, but, I mean, I would be happy to uh, consider anything that our own committee would bring to us uh, as a recommendation and, uh, you know, most likely look at it more than favorably, certainly. Okay. I think that makes sense, Mike. Um, yeah, so I, I would recommend that we bring that Which to I'll, the DEI group, our DEI subcommittee. Again, it's, we have yet to have a meeting, so, on the town side. Right. Yep. Okay. All right, thank you. Sounds good. All right, so with that, do we have a motion? I'll make a motion that we, school committee, amend the school calendar as presented. Motion by Mr. Hayes. Second. Second by Mr. Long. Roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Lindblom? Yes. Brainley? Yes. Long? Yes. Gates? Yes. Hayes? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously.
Just in time for the first day of school. Um, all right, moving on to new business, student handbooks. Oh boy. Thank you, Chairman Gates. Um, this is a unique year for us, obviously, um, with everything, but our, our handbooks obviously have to res reflect the times we're dealing with as well. And I know our principals have been working hard with their teams uh, to come up with that. So I'll turn it over to our team to see what order we're gonna go in. Um, high school, is, is that Ms. McGuire, Dr. McGuire, do you wanna start off? So we, we put things in your packets for a, a, an executive summary and then uh, the principals can pop in and um, highlight those changes and then answer any questions after we go each group. So we'll start off with uh, Dr. McGuire. If you need to be on mute, I think the easiest way is to raise your hand and I can recognize you. There we, uh, no. there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. We have a few changes in the high school handbook for this year. Uh, in addition to the changes that I'm presenting, we did change the format of the, of the handbook for overall readability. That content doesn't change, but we do have the changes that I'll go through now. On pages eight and nine, we have an update to the home to school connection. And we added a section that gives parents and students the contact information and contact person for any concern they may have through the school year. It's a quick reference that can help eliminate the who do I go to if I have a question uh, and about very commonly asked questions, whether it's about grades and need to change a schedule, want to discuss lunch allergies and things of that nature. This, that, the second change is on page 12. It's an update to the digital use policy for online etiquette and impersonation. One of the areas we want to impress upon our students who are using uh, Google Meet and Zoom is the importance of online accountability and etiquette and the use of appropriate language. Uh, and with this policy, the need to represent oneself and be transparent in that representation to ensure accountability. Uh, similar to that, uh, update on page 13 is a no recording policy. This is a newer policy in accordance with state and federal law that students and parents must refrain from recording any video conference or virtual lesson. Uh, staff is able to tell students that they may not record at the start of each online session. On page 15, we updated reporting absences to add just a dedicated situate email address as the preferred method of communicating an absence. On page 26, we added types of assessments. With part of the hybrid and remote learning models, it necessitates a difference in how we assess and evaluate student work. We want students and families to be able to clarify the difference between a formative assessment, which can help teachers assess student levels of understanding at a given point, for example, an exit or entrance ticket, homework or learning checks, whereas a summative assessment is where the teacher measures overall learning and the level of mastery of content and skills. This would be exams, tests, projects, and other um, opportunities to show what they know. On page 31, we updated our social networking, electronic messaging, and phone usage policy to really reflect the practice that we have and the number of scenarios that arise that um, come into the school, school building, but really start with social media and various use of um, online apps. This policy reminds students that when using online tools, members of the Situate Public Schools community must use appropriate behavior when the communication impacts or is likely to impact the classroom environment in the Situate Public Schools. Students are responsible for their own social media accounts and must adhere to appropriate use when using social media both inside and outside of school. Communications on social media by students brought to the attention of school administrators, which may impact the immediate school environment and the safety of all students or have impact on our students' well-being are subject to investigation by the administration and consequences per our code of conduct. On page 32, we updated our language around vape detectors, which we have had in use for about a year now. Since tobacco and marijuana products are prohibited in schools, we're updating the policy to read that if a student is in the restroom when the detector alarm is set off, they are subject to search and parents will be notified. This may not always be the case, but we wanna be able to use the detectors as a preventative measure in school 
and we will continue to use the data as well to inform our other prevention practices. And then we have on page 61 updates for our student leaders, officers, and team captains. For all students, we want to have consistency in this policy with regard to students in leadership roles, including social media, in and out of school behaviors, while holding a leadership position representing Situate High School. In the past, this was a policy that um, was uh, listed for athletic captains or class officers, but not all students representing Situate High in a leadership role. And then finally, we have the COVID addendum to the high school handbook on pages 62 through 72. This concludes all the information pertaining to the high school as pulled from the Situate Public Schools reopening plan and is geared toward specific information regarding um, arrival, dismissal, uh, lunches, mask breaks, everything COVID as pertaining to uh, the high school, high school specifically. That's all I have on this end. Uh, any comments or questions from the committee? Uh, just a quick question, Dr. McGuire. So how much time do you generally spend on the handbooks versus how much time did you spend this year doing it? So uh, we have wanted to update the handbook uh, as a visual for several years anyway. So we did a, a really thorough reading. Uh, we met with students at the end of the year and talked about our handbook and some revisions that we wanted to make. Um, and we also uh, work with our school council on handbook. Um, so this year we really um, worked across stakeholders to get in, gather information that we wanted to have represented. And we really wanted the book to be a living document that we can point to and refer to when we're working with students and families. So we wanted it to reflect not just what we thought the practice should be, but what our uh, common practices and responses to scenarios is as, as we live it. So we really looked at kind of a reflection of the work that we do, the conversations and the interactions we have with students and families, and we just wanted the language to reflect that practice. Quite some time is the answer. <laughs> no, thank you. This is, I've asked this, I asked this question at our last meeting and I ask, I think every year when we go through these handbooks, I just want to make sure that there is a process so that the students are aware of these new and updated policies, specifically some of the ones you said today, the online ones, social media, but also the harassment ones and, and others that we approved the last few meetings. I want to make sure that those are specifically highlighted and that, that the students are all aware of that. So upon approval, the handbook will go home to students and families and be updated on our website. We also go over the handbook with every student on the first day of school uh, as part of their orientation. That will happen this upcoming Wednesday with students. And okay. then I will send an additional um, letter of information home to families to update the changes. Great. Thank you. I think that's really important. So thank you for doing Absolutely. that. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? I had one quick question, Pete. And uh, it was in regards to the uh, adding school leaders to the uh, policy. And does the policy define what is define what a school leader is, or is that defined somewhere in the handbook? So typically, uh, it's anyone who is in a position of leadership in a club or activity. So most of our clubs have a president, a treasurer, a secretary. Uh, those positions were not explicitly stated in the policy before, so we wanted it to have equal weight and bearing with our captains and our class officers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And there are questions, comments? All right. Um, do you want to, well, I guess we'll. Uh, hmm? all right, yeah, we'll run through them all and do a vote afterwards. But okay. All right. You have to wait, Dr. McGuire, to get our approval, I guess. Uh, all right. Next, I believe it would be Mr. Beatty. You should be unmuted. You are a co-host. It should be all yours. Excellent. Good evening. Thank you for having us tonight. Uh, at Gates, we have five changes to the handbook for the 2021 school year. On page six through eight, we've updated uh, to reflect our new staff members. Uh, on page nine, the dates have been updated for our trimester and report card publication. 
to match the school calendar. Uh, perhaps the heftiest portion of our handbook is the addition of our COVID-19 health, safety, and educational guidelines. Uh, here we talk specifically about our programming, our plans for special populations, and then some of the policies that we'll be following pertaining to masks, physical distancing, hand hygiene, no recording, arrival, dismissal, lunch, hallways, stairwells, dismissal, discipline, and remote learning expectations. Um, they are in line with uh, those that Dr. McGuire presented um, in order to remain consistent across the secondary levels. Um, then on page 15, we updated and provided some clarity around our Gates Core Values Awards. And finally, on page 29, we updated our school hours to reflect um, the school hours for this year, which are remaining the same. All right, that's it. That wasn't ex as exciting as Dr. McGuire's. Uh, we, we banned cell phones last year, so we got that out of the way last year. <laughs> <laughs> nice work. Uh, questions or comments from the committee? Nope, I'm all set. Well, all right. Um, seeing none, we can move on to elementary. You just need to know who will be presenting. If you are presenting, please raise your hand. Donna Moffitt. Yeah, that's me. Good evening. Hi, Donna. Oh, yeah. yeah going to <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you for having us. And uh, we are not as exciting as Lisa McGuire's book. Uh, handbook either we had some changes we did go through some of the name changes and the date changes uh, we added our new principal uh, Wampatuck Tracy Reardon to on page four we also updated um, Rebecca Long's last name to reflect her um, her marriage over the last year so from Kelly to Long on page five we added all of the officers um, in the new positions of the school committee as well as added our, the name of our superintendent um, on page 24, we updated all of our school hours and our ECC hours to reflect our hybrid model. Um, and on in the bulk of our changes came starting on page 36, where we also uh, took what was done with the, from the high school as well as the middle school, and um, and put it into an appendix for us to talk, to deal with the COVID-19. Um, including some of the, protoc the, the protocols, um, our educational program continuum, special prop populations, the no recording policy, uh, hand hygiene, um, which at the elementary level we will continually to review, and um, uh, you know our procedures, our remote learning expectations. So that was all added in as well. And it is very similar to what uh, you'll see at the Gates and in the Gates handbook. Great, thank you. Any uh, question, questions or comments from the committee? I am all set. Well, well thank you. Seeing none. Um, yeah, um, let's do the, let's do the schools right now. Do the schools. I have to do one at a time. It looks like. All right. Just need a motion um, on the high school handbook. Move to approve the Citroen High School handbook uh, changes as presented. Motion by Mr. Hayes. For the handbook. A second. Second by Ms. Linlong. Uh, roll call vote Gates, yes. Long. Yes. Kaylene. Yes. Linlong. Yes. Hayes. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, could have a similar motion on the middle school handbook. So moved. <laughs> Motion by Mr. Hayes. Second. Second. Thank you by Mr. Long. Yes. yes. Long. Yes. Brain leading. Yes. And Long. Yes. Hayes. Yes. <laughs> uh, motion passes unanimously, and I would entertain a motion on the elementary school handbook. Move as presented. <laughs> motion by Mr. Hayes. Second. Second by Mr. Long. Eight, yes, long. Yes. Brandolini. Yes. Lim long. Yes. Hayes. Yes. 
motion passed unanimously. Congratulations to all three levels of schools. I know it's a lot of work. It's kind of anticlimactic. It just, it just kind of ends. But thank you for all your work. I know it's not that much fun, but I really appreciate it. It's important stuff, especially this year. It's not, it's not really that much fun. They would be rather doing other things, I'm sure. Um, all right, on to you, Mr. Umbriana, the Athletic Handbook. Uh, I think should be able to talk. Okay. Awesome. Uh, well, first and foremost, I want to thank Dr. McGuire for help uh, reorganizing and revamping the look of the Athletic Handbook to be very consistent with the high school. The chances of me figuring out how to do that would have taken me probably this whole school year. So thank you, uh, first and foremost. Uh, just to start, a couple changes with the Athletic Handbook. Uh, nothing too, too major. Um, cover page, obviously just updated the school year dates. Table of content, um, I did update the link to the MIA Handbook. Uh, they, the most up-to-date version will cover 2021 to 2023. So I just updated the link to the new handbook there. Um, on page six of the athletic handbook, uh, participation in tryout changes. Um, I did it, uh, add a language uh, with the limit of the size of a team um, due to COVID-19 restrictions. Again, hopefully we won't have to limit uh, roster si sizes, but with some uh, state and sport specific modifications that might uh, become an unfortunate thing. Uh, also added in language on tryouts, a tryout checklist. Um, I know I get a lot of questions about that, but it uh, just gives the breakdown of what we had discussed earlier, family ID um, from the impact testing, user fees. Uh, one language, piece of language we did add into that tryout checklist um, is that all uniforms and equipment from pre previous season must be returned in full. Um, that will come into, hopefully come into effect uh, where family ID, you can actually uh, not be approved to try out if you have not returned a uniform from a pre previous season. Um, I do know uniforms somehow disappear at times, so we're going to do a good job trying to keep uh, track of them. I did move up the following section, team cuts into this section. I thought it was fitting. Um, on page eight of the athletic handbook, I did add new language into the section under physicals. Um, I did want to put in the rule uh, per the MIA, if a student does play with an expired physical, that violation includes that the student uh, will be suspended for the number of contests in which they participated without a proper physical. So that just goes to sh show how important it is for us to have our physicals. Um, Player eligibility on page eight, I did change the language to middle school eligibility. Um, we did allow uh, last year for a couple of our middle school, uh, middle schools to play at the high school level. Um, I did wanna just throw in language on, you know, how that works because I think once we allowed one team to do it, I think there was a lot of miscommunication uh, and misunderstanding on uh, why every team couldn't do it. So I did wanna throw language into uh, there and the, the biggest thing there is a middle school student is eligible to represent a uh, senior high school team uh, on its athletic teams only when the school uh, includes those grades and they're under the direct jurisdiction of in supervision of the high school principal. So if the high school principal is overlooking both middle school and high school, that would allow for all middle schoolers to play. But obviously in this case, that doesn't. So we still need to get that waiver processed uh, through and approved by the Patriot League and the MIA. That's on hold right now for uh, this school year due to uh, the uncertainty of sports. Uh, language on page 12 of the athletic handbook. Um, we did add a new team scholar athlete selection language uh, where we're just gonna, um, every year the Patriot League allows our teams to um, honor a scholar athlete to one of our, uh, the members of the team, which is a great award. Um, but we wanted to add in language that it's given out to the senior on the team with the highest overall GPA. Um, and then page 31, the big one is everybody else's uh, handbooks have. Uh, it's a big MOU on COVID-19 and, uh, you know, the impact of COVID-19 high school sports and what the MIA and the Patriot League are doing. Um, to stay on top of that. We also added it in language on the four seasons. Uh, and we do understand, you know, that modifications and guidelines are changing every day. So um, I did add in the link to the task force page. 
um, for all the update information on any possible changes with high school sports and situate uh, with the MIA. Great, thank you. Any questions or comments for athletic director? I am all set. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. You can go, Ms. Lindblom. Hey, Pete, I have a question about the, um, the physicals and how they would expire. Because um, so I know submitting, you know, signing up for sports, you have to submit a physical. So is there a case where like the physical that is submitted would expire? So the- yeah. yeah, so physicals are good for 13 months. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, upon uh, submitting that physical, they, they will have till 13 months mm -hmm. till the uh, physical now gets expired. Okay. And was the language for the, the steps to sign up, was that not in the handbook pre before? Um, I did not see it in the handbook to sign up for sports. So I did add that in there. Oh. Hmm. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Could I have one just because I think it comes up every so often, just randomly. I know that you had spoke about the potential to reduce the size of the teams from what I'm hearing it's just because of transportation to away games. Um, do you know what the rule is on providing transportation to away games? Um, is it over a certain number of miles? Is it, you know, what are the rules and regulations if you happen to know that? I'm just, I'm just curious. I know it won't change this, but I'm just curious what those rules and regulations are. Uh, as of right now, the only major rule and regulation is just the total number that we are allowing on a bus. Uh, but in, in general, in regular times, um, when is it required to take uh, a bus to a sporting or other event off of our campus? I guess whenever, uh, I don't really, I, I actually don't know, but I, I would just assume, you know, that it would, I actually don't, I don't know the answer to that. That's right. No, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. I think that, I think that uh, and the question comes up from time to time. Uh, yeah. So at some point, it, it's not a big deal, but I'm just curious if there's, if there's something in the rules that, you know, limit our, I'm not opening this up, but if it limits our ability to transport kids, but maybe there's a way to get kids there. Other ways. I don't want to open that up, but I'm just curious what the rule is in general. That's all. Okay. Sorry to put you on the spot. No, no worries. I'll, I'll take a look into that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if there's no other questions, I will entertain a motion for the athletic handbook. Move to approve the uh, athletic handbook is presented. Motion by Mr. Hayes, second. Second. Second by Ms. Lynn Blom. Um, Brandolini. Yes. Long. Yes. Gates, yes. Minister Hayes. Yes. And Ms. Lynn Blom. Yes. Motion <laughs> passes nicely. Thank you. Um, all right. Moving on the agenda, the Memorandum of Understanding, Superintendent Burkhead. Thank you, Chairman Gates. So, uh, we've been in uh, negotiations with our uh, Associate Teachers Association over the last um, weeks, and um, this memorandum of understanding is one of two that will be coming your way. We thought it was important to break it into two, the first one being uh, shared tonight, focusing on the professional development days and um, PPE and safety, as well as um, HVAC and air quality and things like that. So um, that's the one you have before you for a vote. And um, my recommendation, and I believe um, <coughs> part of, I believe the, uh, I, knew, I know, excuse me, the STA has already signed off on this. So it would be my recommendation to uh, approve this memorandum of understanding. Move to approve as presented. From the committee. Seeing none, I would uh, entertain a motion. Move to approve as presented. Was that Mr. Hayes? He was, he's frozen, but I can hear him. <laughs> he motioned, I seconded. All right, I can see you, Mr. Yeah. Hayes. Uh, motion by Mr. Hayes, second by Mr. Long. Gate, yes. Lynn Long. Yes. Brandon Leaning. Yes. Long. Yes. Hayes. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you. Congratulations, Mr. Burkett, and to the uh, STA. Good work for everybody. Um, this is the second and final uh, 
portion of the agenda for public comment. If you have a comment, please uh, use your reaction emoji and raise your hand and I will ask you to unmute. Okay. Uh, Cheryl Rydell. Hi, um, Chairman Gates, I actually am seeking clarification. I heard you request a, um, an address from one of the previous public commenters and my understanding was that we had to talk about where our kids were from and not necessarily present an address. Is, can you clarify that? That, is, that is true, Ms. Rydell. The uh, presenter or the person speaking did not uh, have a student in the district. So therefore I asked them for their address. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kate Martin. Hi, I'm Kate Martin. I teach at Cushing School. Um, I believe at a previous meeting, Dr. Dutch had spoken about getting testing for the staff, but that was something being worked out and I didn't know if there was any more information about that. Okay. Uh, Superintendent Burkhead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Martin. It's a great question. We've been working really hard on doing this and I think Dr. Dutch may be able to add some insight as well. Um, we were looking at some antibody testing um, until uh, even today and we're continuing to look at some other types of testing. Um, with our great medical board, we bounced some of these ideas off them and there were some pros and cons to the most recent testing that we we're looking at doing. So I'm not sure we're going to move forward with that. We still have to run it by the Medical Advisory Committee on Thursday. Um, so we will be doing that. There's a number of different tests out there. We want to make sure that it's um, affordable, feasible, and that it give us, gives us the results we want. So at this point, we again, we have an antibody test we're looking at. Um, it has to pass the muster through our medical committee, and we're going to meet on Thursday to look at that. Um, but it, it is our goal to try to find something for our staff that we can use and then also subsidize and, and make available for free. So that's kind of what we're working on now. Great, thank you. Uh, any other questions, oh, sorry, comments from the public? I'm not seeing any. Seeing none, uh, we will move on to the next part of our agenda, the leadership report, Superintendent Burkhead. Thank you, Chairman Gates. Um, you know, I just really, I just want to thank everybody. It's, you know, been a couple months on the job now, and I'm just really proud of the direction we've taken and just the, the people that have stepped up, you know, everywhere from uh, administrators to teachers to custodians, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, uh, town, town um, members that have worked with us, town administrator, board of health, our local physicians, um, you saw many of them presented tonight at their school nurses. Um, I'm just I'm extremely impressed because this has been a daunting undertaking. Um, where there's a lot of excitement in the air and nervousness, uh, but I also think that's a good thing because it's typical of any new school year. I'm just happy that we're going to have the opportunity to open our doors for kids on Wednesday. It's two days, two days away, so I know we're all probably getting the butterflies. I know I still do. Um, you know, and I just want to thank everybody, just a sincere thank you to our staff and to our families for your patience, to our school committee, for your guidance and confidence and trust. And, you know, we're ready. And um, I'm just going to ask everybody out there to kind of continue that, um, that photo confidence, but also, you know, to ask the questions and um, to continue to be patient as we learn and move forward together. We're very well prepared, but like any new school year, there's going to be some um, roadblocks that we get through, but I think we're, we're prepared to do that. And so I want to thank everybody in, in our philosophy will stay the same. We're just going to over communicate. We're going to be transparent. We're going to listen and we're going to learn and we're going to get better. And to be the best, you have to do that. And so I'm confident we have the team in place after being here two months. I think I'm a good judge of character. We've got the right people in, on the bus and in the right seats to make this district uh, move forward. So uh, I look forward to 
uh, next report when we'll, we'll share uh, about what our kids are doing in classrooms and even for this Thursday thoughts we'll have some photos of orientation and things like that so it's a real exciting time it's, it's back to school and just to update people you know real quickly I know the uh, principals did a real nice job of sending out very specific correspondence home last week um, and we're having the video come out I think which will be helpful but um, the orientation information is important uh, even though that's a that day is remote, I want to thank our, our teachers for making themselves available for orientation on that Wednesday. Kids are coming into the buildings and getting, um, you know, getting acclimated. Also at the elementary level, we'll be having the orientation for the parents. I think at that age level, it's very important. So I want to thank those teachers for making themselves available as those paraprofessionals and, and principals for doing that. Um, the first day of school is Wednesday, this Wednesday, September 16th. But as we all know, on the hybrid model, it's a remote day. So there'll be some remote activities for it, the students, but there'll also be that orientation opportunity, which is optional. And we hope you can take advantage of that. There's been a lot of hard work going into that. And I think that will alleviate some anxiety for the kids to come in and actually check the buildings out. Um, also, um, Thursday is the first day of buses. So the transportation will start on Thursday uh, for our cohort B group. And kindergarten's first day will also be on that Thursday. And the ECC, our Early Childhood Center program, will start the following Monday, next Monday, the 21st. And um, let's see. So it is, you know, as far as the report, what I'd like to present in the upcoming weeks, and as we go along, I think you've got a flavor for it tonight, is that um, I want to see our, our work witnessed through the lens of the people that make their district great. Like tonight, we had a, um, you know, we had our athletic director on. We had our principals presenting, um, you know, about all the things that are going on in the district. We had our medical committee and nurses presenting. So I want the professionals in our district to highlight them, to celebrate them, and to inform the community what we're doing. So we'll continue. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that and, and continue to learn like that. So I, I appreciate that type of presenting. I know we'll be starting up and I'm getting excited for our student presentations because that's what ultimately it's all about here. So it'd be exciting to get the students involved in our, in our meetings, um, in our upcoming meetings. So I'm looking forward to that. And the last thing I have for tonight is just some, you know, another, I think, tenant of, of our work this year is the community connections. I know Chairman Gates has mentioned. I know it's a priority to him and to the committee. Um, we've got, I, I think we've built, we're building a real strong relationship with our town um, and they're, they're really fine folks to work with. They've been very receptive to our requests. Um, and so uh, Dr. Dutch and I were, went over to meet with um, uh, town administrator, Jim Boudreau, director of recreation, Maura Clancy, uh, Glancy, excuse me, and assistant director, Nick Lombardo this week, uh, excuse me, last week to look at um, space in the, uh, the, the, the old Gates Middle School, uh, under the new guidelines from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, there's a possibility where schools can open their own remote, remote learning centers. So we're looking at a partnership where the town would allow us to use space over at the Gates School. There's some still some, you know, really fine classrooms over there that are usable. I know Recreation uses them. Um, and we've got, we've got um, the reception was excellent, let's put it that way. And so what we're working on now is the potential to start some um, a potential learning environment over there that will help our, our young families with uh, young children uh, to offset the AM PM scheduling that we have, which we know is tough for um, our community members, maybe with daycare options. So if we had a, an option over there that uh, kids could go and finish up their afternoon work or their morning work opposite their school schedule time, we think that would be helpful. We also wanna help our uh, educators uh, in the district that have children uh, we know it's very difficult with a hybrid model to, especially if, if um, you know, your kids aren't in school on one day and you still have to come in. So we're, we're looking at doing something to help the entire community. The town is on board with it. So I want you just to stay tuned. It's, there's a lot of details that have to be worked out, but we're, we're making that a high priority. So uh, I'll be reporting out at subsequent meetings on our progress on that. But I just did, did want to let people know that we understand that this hybrid model is, you know, scheduling wise could be a, can wreak havoc on some people's uh, lives. And we are looking to work with our, uh, our town to make life a little bit easier by offering some type of remote learning for, the, for our younger students. 
Great. Thank you. I, I think that um, I probably speak for the committee too, that uh, we thank you, Superintendent Burkhead and everyone involved in, uh, in the school ready schools ready for the first day. I think that uh, I don't know our last day was March 9th, March 8th, March 14th, whatever it was a really long time ago. Um, it's great to have the kids finally going back. Um, you've, I guess, technically only been in our district since July 1st. Is that right? So, uh, <laughs> uh, You've done quite a bit of work in uh, what 65 75 days um, so we appreciate it um, I know a lot of hard work has gone I know it's not rare to see uh, my daughter calls the Jeep truck uh, over at the uh, superintendent's office on Sunday Sunday afternoon Sunday mornings so we appreciate you know you're going above and beyond so we appreciate it <laughs> um, so we thank you uh, and one, um, I guess, I think it was Miss Martin, Kate Martin. Did you did you have the comment about the testing? Um, I just needed you to state your name and or your address or where your children go to school. I'm not sure I collected that. If you could just raise your hand again for the record. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'm a teacher at Cushing, Kate Martin. Okay, thank you very much. Um, all right. I think that should do it. Uh, moving on. Uh, subcommittee report. The diversity, equity, and inclusion update. Uh, Nicole and Jen. Good evening, Chairman Gates, school committee members. Um, so Nicole Brandiolini and I talked the other day, or we've been talking actually over the past couple of weeks about our next steps. Um, admittedly, this work has fallen a bit behind with the school reopening. We um, have had to put this to the side. However, I don't want anyone to think that this, that means we're not focusing on this work. So we have a meeting coming up, a scheduled meeting for Thursday, September 24th, virtually um, at six. And what we'll be doing is we'll look to draft our anti-resolution, uh, anti, excuse me, anti-racism resolution for the school committee. Um, because I know that that was our first task. So we're hoping to get that drafted at that time we will once we draft it, we'll bring the advisory board together and finalize the draft and then the, bring the draft back to the subcommittee before we present it to the school committee. So that's the plan for that. And um, the members before the next committee me meeting will have to do some reading. Um, I told them they'd have homework. Um, so they'll do some reading and basically look at that mask anti-racism resolution that we had originally read and what the other districts around us are doing using their resolutions and then from across the country what other people are doing. So just to, to look at all of those and then land on a good document to propose to the school committee. Great, thank you. And now you have uh, the uh, review of all of the uh, naming of the holiday observances to put yes. on your list too. Yes, I don't think we'll do that first. No. I think we'll do that later, <laughs> if that's okay. We just needed to coordinate that with, again, the uh, when our calendar comes out. And again, we'll probably look at it sometime in March. Probably can yep. be later than that, but yep. you have time. Yeah. But, but you're right, I will research things ahead of time. Good. Reach out to my Lighthouse group. Sounds good. Any uh, questions, comments from the committee? All right, seeing none, thank you very much, Ms. Arnold. Sure. Um, moving on the agenda, correspondence. We have no correspondence this evening. Here we go, warrants. Dr. Dutch gets to read two warrants. Good evening. Uh, you should host Dr. Dutch, and you should be good to go. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, so the, the warrants this evening, uh, first warrant is S200903 for a total amount of $106,902.62. The significant purchases uh, financially out of the revolving account for school lunch, $8,931.31. Majority of which was for the software system for Schoolbox. Then, out of the LEA account, uh, the total there was ninety-seven thousand one hundred and six seventy-six. Uh, the majority of that was private school tuition, sixty-six thousand two hundred eighty-five dollars and nineteen cents to five uh, six five different uh, special ed private schools. Um, I think those were the only significant purchases on that first warrant, and that was signed by committee member Lindblom. The second warrant this week um, is S200910 for a total amount of $173,245.57. Uh, the significant Dollar purchases there. Uh, electrical utilities, $30,814.52. Um, we had in building maintenance supply, $30,125. That was for sanitizing stations, which should be reimbursable. And then in IT contracted services, $58,661.23. And that was for work on the firewall in all six of our buildings. And that is a, a reduced rate because that is eligible for federal E-rate funding. The LEA total was 168,189.04. And again, that warrant was signed by committee member Lindblom. Be happy to answer any questions uh, through the chair. Great, thank you. Sounds good to me. Anyone here? All right. No, thank you very much. You're welcome. Sure, thank you. I'm sure the excitement will uh, will continue once the school year begins. I'm, I'm sure that the the values of these will go up as the school year goes uh, comes along. All right. Thank you again. Um, uh, any other business? Any school committee member? like to discuss? I have a question for uh, Superintendent. Nothing. I guess I'll just take this. Oh, sorry, Mike. Bill, uh, do we, can you give us the number of uh, teachers who have uh, been granted leave of absences? I'm going to have to see if how Bonnie Donahue he's on the call. Bonnie, do you have an estimate on that? Can you unmute her? We're still working on those. I think there uh, have been quite a few unpaid leaves that have been granted, um, requested by staff members um, who are nervous of coming, coming back into the buildings. Um, so I, I would think it, as of today, probably about 10, we're working on quite a few more this week. Maybe uh, you can send us a email or a report on that. Yeah, I can certainly do that, Mike. Thank you. Anything else? Um, I guess I'll just finally say that uh, you know, again, I already mentioned it, but I would give a standing ovation if I could, but you won't be able to see me stand up. So, I mean, there's a lot of work that's been going on since, I don't know, since probably April or May. Um, behind the scenes that we haven't seen, and we're going to begin to, to, to see all that um, on Wednesday. So, I, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, all the school committee members do. We've all been working hard as well, but on on various tasks, you guys are actually working on um, on the things where students are going to most benefit. And that's why we're all here. So we really do appreciate it. We know it hasn't been easy, and it will, you know, we'll, we'll 
have obstacles as we proceed, but uh, thank you again for all your hard work and effort. Um, but that being said, um, I would entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting at 8.44. Motion by Mr. Hayes, there a second? A second. Second by Ms. Lillian Long. Uh, Gates, yes. Long. Yes. Brianna Leading. Yes. Lynn Long. Yes. Hayes. Yes. Great, thank you.